I reviewed every main series Pokemon game within the span of a year. And now I'm back with something just as stupidly draining. Look, I'm not the biggest fan of the Pokemon anime. Or anime in general. It's nothing against the medium, I actually love anime for what it is, it's just... I struggle to pay attention to any media that isn't a game or a YouTube video for whatever reason. It's a whole kind of worms I'd rather not get into. Point is, I struggle to pay attention to anime, so I don't watch a lot of it. Much less the Pokemon anime, which is 25 years of content and then some. But when I say I'm not the biggest fan of it, I mean that in the literal sense. Not in the way people usually do when they say they're not the biggest fan of something, i.e. as a substitute for saying they don't like it. I actually do like the Pokemon anime, being a Pokemon fan and all, it's just... I'm not a die-hard Pokemon anime fanatic. I have really enjoyed the Pokemon anime whenever I've checked it out though, especially the Gen 4 anime, which is mainly what I grew up with. Although, I think it's a little far-fetched for me to review every generation of the Pokemon anime, considering I can barely sit through a season at times. So I thought, why not give reviewing all of the movies a go? It can't be that hard, can it? Then I remembered we're at over 20 movies and regretted ever thinking up the idea, but screw it, we're already here, so let's go for it. But first, let's get some context on my experience with the anime, so you guys can understand any weird takes I may have, or any blind spots I may have in my knowledge of the anime. So far, I've only watched a few episodes of the original anime, a decent amount of Gen 3, all of Gen 4, and a decent amount of Gen 5. Everything else is new to me, so again, forgive any ignorance I may have towards certain characters or scenarios. Also, I won't be looking at any specials, shorts, or any other kind of extras in this video. That will be its own separate video sometime in the future. Finally, I'll be looking exclusively at English dubs for all movies, unless stated otherwise. I understand that there may be some differences between the Japanese and international dubs, but I don't really have the time to comb over the differences. Now, with all of that out of the way, let's finally get into it with Pokemon the first movie, Mewtwo Strikes Back. Michael, what are you doing here? Well, it only makes sense for the biggest Pokemon fan on YouTube to talk about the very first Pokemon movie. You literally know nothing about Pokemon. Do you even know what a Mewtwo is? <laughs> of course I do. He was introduced in Super Smash Bros. Melee. Well, you're not wrong, I guess. Oh, fuck it, you can join me, but only for this movie. Now before we get into it, some context on why the first movie was such a big deal and why some of the later movies didn't really make as big an impact. We all know how big Pokemon was in the 90s, so I'm not going to give you the whole spiel about how Red and Blue were the biggest games ever at the time and blah blah bullshit. But what I will say is that the Pokemon anime coming at the time that it did only served to further push the franchise into the stratosphere. Not every kid could get a Game Boy and play the games, but almost every kid had a TV at their house and could watch the TV show. Thus, the anime made Pokemon even more popular with kids, so creating a feature length film was essentially a no brainer. And much like the anime that set it up, the movie came at just the right time. Pokemania was at a fever pitch, and the Pokemon movie was bound to do well. And it did, unsurprisingly. However, as time went on and Pokemon's popularity started to wane, the Pokemon movies became less and less relevant to the mainstream. At least in the West. Making this one of the only Pokemon movies to leave much of a mark on pop culture. So, let's take a critical look at this movie and see if it's worth the hype surrounding it, even all of these years later, and if it deserved to be such a smash hit at the box office. The movie opens with Dr. Fuji narrating an expedition he and his team are on, looking for Mew, a Pokemon said to be one of the strongest in the world. The goal of their expedition is to find some DNA of the mystical Pokemon, in hopes to create a superior clone for the leader of Team Rocket, Giovanni. However, Dr. Fuji didn't agree to help Giovanni because he liked his plans, but because he wants to help himself by cloning his late daughter Amber. Something his wife was strongly against for some reason. The team ends up finding one of Mew's eyelashes and uses it to create the most powerful Pokemon in the world, Mewtwo. The team believes that Mewtwo has not yet gained consciousness, but little do they know he has telepathic abilities, which he is able to use to talk to the other clone Pokemon in the lab, including the clone of Dr. Fuji's daughter, Amber 2. Amber 2 and Mewtwo grow a special bond. She teaches him his ABCs, tells him about the nature of humans and Pokemon, and that all other non-worthy Pokemon all get Thanosed away. 
This distresses Mewtwo so much that the scientists read a spike in his brain activity and they decide to build cause or I mean I mean use a memory wiping serum to calm him down. Over time Mewtwo grows into a big boy, but still retains vague memories of Amber too. And that suddenly makes the title make a lot more sense. I mean, Mewtwo Strikes Back, that's a straight sequel title if I've ever heard. How, how are you gonna put the phrases Mewtwo Strikes Back and the first movie in the same title? I mean, what if this really is your first introduction to Pokemon? Who's Mewtwo? What is he striking back against? What am I just supposed to guess this shit? That's a very good point. I always thought the name was a little weird, but this little prologue definitely makes the whole thing make a lot more sense. Prologue? Yep, this is all just a prologue known as the uncut story of Mewtwo's origin, which is a mouthful. It was supposedly present in the special Japanese screenings of the movie, but was omitted from the original Japanese screenings, as well as overseas, for reasons. However, I thought it was worth talking about since it makes the whole movie make a lot more sense. Speaking of which, getting back to the plot, the movie proper opens with a fully grown Mewtwo breaking out of his test tube before asking Dr. Fuji and his team what he is. They respond by telling him he's a clone of another Pokemon called Mew before they start celebrating and congratulating each other which annoys Mewtwo as he feels as if he's nothing but an experiment to these humans. Enraged, the Pokemon destroys the lab, killing all of the scientists in the process. Giovanni then shows up, offering to help Mewtwo to learn how to control and concentrate his powers and grow even stronger. Mewtwo spends a few weeks capturing wild Pokemon and beating any trainers who dare to challenge the Viridian Gym, one of which is Gary Oak. While this helps Mewtwo unlock his power, he still questions his overall purpose. And when he finds out his whole reason for existing is to serve Giovanni, he goes into a fit of rage destroying the Team Rocket building. He goes back to the island where he was created and vows to take control of all Pokemon. We then cut to Ash, Misty and Brock hanging out in some random field, when Ash is challenged to a battle by some random trainer, leading into an opening credit sequence with what I believe is a superior rendition of the first Pokemon theme song. Yeah, I said it. The vocals, the instrumentation, the goddamn solo, every little bit of it is better, if not at the very least, just as good as the original. I unfortunately can't play it for you guys, but I implore you all to go check it out. If I can interject for just a second here, personally, I think that this song makes for a really cool and interesting remix of the original. It tries something a little different here, and I admire it for that, but Genuinely, I don't believe that it tops the original score. The R&B style that they aim for here is nothing compared to that original hard-hitting rock style. And another thing, this singer is hitting the vibrato way too hard. Like the original, it goes, To catch them is my real test. To drain them is my cause. Right, and in this one, it goes, To catch them is my real test. To drain them is my cause. Like, is that really necessary? Like, can you shut the fuck up? Okay, yeah, that's a very good point. The singer for the movie version, Billy Crawford, really goes off of his runs, which is something I'd usually be super against, especially with how sacred the Jason Page original is, but somehow it just works, but maybe that's just me. Anyway, while this battle is going on, Ash is being spied on by Team Rocket, who are no doubt up to their usual shenanigans. But before they can even attempt to steal Pikachu, a Dragonite swoops in and presents Ash with an invitation, sent by some woman asking him to come to New Island to fight the world's strongest trainer. The gang arrives at the Pokemon Center where they find that the fairies have been cancelled and Nurse Joy has gone missing. The Peer Master, Miranda, mentions that a very similar storm had killed many people long ago. But most of the trainers, including Ash and his pals, ignore this warning and proceed to try and make it to the island. However, they got some weak sauce Pokemans, so they end up seeking help from a couple of disguised misfits better known as Team Rocket. They also fail though, but with the help of Squirtle and Staryu, the gang get to the island in one piece. Team Rocket also manages to survive this because of their plot armor. As our heroes stumble onto the island, they're met by the mysterious woman from the hologram invitation thing, and she invites them in. At the same time, Team Rocket find their way into the island's fortress, with the mythical Pokemon Mew showing up and following closely behind them. We cut back to Ash and friends who are led into a dining room, with only three other trainers present, all of whom found their own way to make it to the island. The strange woman then introduces a master, who is none other than Mewtwo himself. 
This causes an uproar among some of the trainers who try to attack him, only to have their Pokemon's attacks rendered useless by the powerful creature. He then proclaims he has no use for the woman who invited Ash, as he releases her from his spell, leading to the reveal that she was the missing Nurse Joy all along. Mewtwo then proceeds to monologue about how humans are evil for enslaving Pokemon, and that the trainers Pokemon are foolish for obeying their masters. Meanwhile on the sidelines, Team Rocket come across Mewtwo's cloning machine. Even Meowth ends up accidentally cloning himself when one of his hairs ends up inside of it. Mewtwo gathers his clones, and Ash suggests that they battle it out against their Pokemon. They unfortunately lose, and Mewtwo begins capturing all of the Pokemon with his specialized Mewtwo balls. All the trainers and their Pokemon try to save themselves from Mewtwo's wrath, some fighting, some running away, and some even trying to recall their Pokemon and keep them safe in their Pokeballs. But even that fails, as Pikachu soon finds himself the last Pokemon standing. This leads to a very intense scene where both Ash and Pikachu fight tooth and nail to try and keep Pikachu from being captured. Oh shit! R run, Pikachu! Run! Run! Oh my god, you can fucking do it! Oh, do dodge Mewtwo's balls! Don't let him touch you with his balls! Unfortunately, Pikachu succumbs to Mewtwo's incredible balls, and he is transported over to the cloning machine. Ash gives chase, and in the process of trying to save his friend, he destroys the machine, freeing all of the clones, as well as the original Pokemon that were captured by our weird, psychic, fetus antagonist. Ash and the other trainer's Pokemon all gather up, and Mewtwo's clones form together as well. Ash attempts to rock Mewtwo's shit, but gets sent flying and is saved by the baby fetus Mew. After attacking him, Mewtwo ensures Mew that clones are much more powerful than the original Pokemon. Mew proceeds to retaliate and tells Mewtwo that a Pokemon's true strength comes from the heart. Mewtwo attacks him again, but instead ends up hitting Ash. This triggers a full-on mosh pit between the Pokemon and the clones. Ash manages to survive the blast and makes a beeline for the stadium floor, in hopes to stop all of the Pokemon fighting. Mew and Mewtwo each fire off incredibly powerful shots, but Ash jumps in the way, screaming at them both to stop fighting. He ends up getting hit and turns to stone. This causes Mewtwo to pause and question why he'd do something so strange. This makes all the Pokemon come to a halt. Pikachu rushes to Ash's side and strikes him with a few bolts of lightning, trying to revive his best friend with no luck. Oh, don't do that! Ah, oh, come on, man! Pikachu crying! No, oh, come on! Oh, all the, the other Pokemon are crying now! Come on! What? Stop! This is too much, man! Come on! Wait, look! Huh? It be the tear of the Goofy Goobers! Okay, I've got to talk about how goddamn iconic this scene is. I know this scene is overpraised to an extent, but for something as innocuous as a Pokemon anime, for this scene to make me feel this much and give me such joy at the same time is unbelievable. It's undoubtedly a classic moment in the Pokemon franchise. And it's then followed up by an even more iconic line from Mewtwo after he realises that humans and Pokemon are equal. He then decides that it's best our heroes don't remember any of this, and erases their memories before transporting them back to the Pokemon Center. Confused by how they got there in the first place, Ash, Missy and Brock decide to step out onto the pier. Ash notices Mew flying around among the clouds, and seems excited by this. We then cut to Team Rocket on a barren new island, also unsure of how they got there, but they decide it's vacation time, and with that, the credits roll. And that's the first movie done. Only 22 to go. How did you find it, Michael? Eh, I think it was an alright little movie. I'm definitely not what some might consider to be the target audience for this flick. I think that some parts were very memorable and some parts were a bit dated, namely the pop cultural musical tracks that they shoved in. The worst offender of this is one of the last scenes where all the Pokemon and the clones are fighting. Instead of letting the intense gravity of the situation flow naturally, they just had to throw in some stupid corny ass song with some guy singing, brother, my brother, tell me, it's like, shut the fuck up, you fucking Broke old cornball, miserable ass piece of trash. Oh, dude, I'm so fucking glad you agree with me on this one. I always found this scene to be so odd, and now I realize it's because of this grating piece of dated 90s crap stinking up what would otherwise be a very powerful scene. And while we're on the topic of negatives, I know Team Rocket are comic relief and couldn't be utilized properly in such a serious plot, but 
God damn, they barely do anything in this movie. In theory, anyone could have taken the roles Team Rocket did in this movie, such as discovering Mewtwo's cloning machine. I just wish they were utilised a little better, or in a more distinct way, but I guess it's not the end of the world. That being said, this movie does a lot well. There's a lot of emotion in this movie, as well as strong themes of identity and purpose, explored through the lens of Mewtwo, which is surprisingly deep for the Pokemon anime, which rarely ever takes itself seriously. Although saying that, we have our silly little pal Mew, doing his thing being cute as fuck throughout the movie, really undercutting the intensity and the grittiness of a lot of the movie. He's definitely my favourite part of the whole film. The whole movie has parts like that in fact, a few light-hearted bits to just oppose the more serious and dark elements that get introduced. I think it's to help kids digest this experience a little bit easier. And honestly, I'm sure that if I had watched this when I was growing up and if I was more in touch with the Pokemon brand, I would probably consider this movie to be a much stronger film as a result. I know 12 year old me would have been in love with this one. That's a fair point. I could appreciate the movie mainly because I'm a Pokemon fan, but also because I watched it while I was a preteen. It was my shit back then. All in all, I think it lives up to what must have been very lofty expectations for a Pokemon cinematic debut at the time. That being said, I always feel like there's a little something missing whenever I rewatch this movie, even if it's with the prologue, but it can all be forgiven, it's still a pretty great movie. Well anyway, it was cool having you here for this Michael, but if you'd be polite enough to fuck off now, I've got like 20 more movies to look at. Oh. Oh, I see. Okay, well, I hope you and your 20 other Pokemon movies end up being very happy with each other. <laughs> Anyway, let's move on to the next movie, Pokemon 2000 The Power of One. Pokemon 2000 was released around the time the franchise started to wane in popularity. It would of course stay strong for another good 20 plus years, but for many at the time it was seen as the beginning of the end for the Pokemon fad so to speak. However, there was still some momentum, so a sequel to the first movie was inevitable. But the Pokemon anime was in an awkward spot being between generations, leading to a sort of side story known as the Orange Islands. I've personally never watched the Orange Islands anime, but I've heard it wasn't the best, so knowing there was a movie released during its run didn't give me much faith in the movie itself. But anyway, let's get into it and see if I was right to feel so cautious. The film opens with someone reciting a cryptic phrase. This someone is revealed to be Lawrence III, a Pokemon collector who has his sights set on the three legendary birds, Articuno, Zapdos and Moltres, as well as a fourth entity known as Lugia. He immediately ventures over to Fire Island to put his plans into motion, inciting the wrath of Moltres. The bird tries its hardest to fight Lawrence's airship, but it's in vain, as it ends up being captured, which leads to shifts in the world's climate, as foretold in the prophecy read by the Collector earlier. We then see our friends Ash, Misty and Tracy travelling to their next destination, letting their Pokemon out to play in the water, while Team Rocket tails them, no doubt after Pikachu as always. And while this is all going on, our ears are being assaulted by this horrid rendition of the Orange Islands theme. Don't get me wrong, the original Orange Islands theme was pretty corny and all over the place musically, but at least it sounded good to the ear. This version is somehow even more all over the place. It's a little hip hop, it's a little pop, it's a little R&B, and it's really shitty. The theme for the first movie was miles better than whatever the fuck this is. God fucking damn. Anyway, after a cute little montage, a storm whisks our heroes to Shamuti Island, and as it so happens, that very same storm has reached Pallet Town and is causing the Pokemon there to act erratic, which leads Oak to believe that something is about to go wrong. Cutting back to Ash and crew, they manage to get on the island unscathed and encounter a tribe. This tribe mentions how they're celebrating a festival and become excited by the fact Ash is a Pokemon trainer. A girl called Melody, who's this year's festival maiden, then crowns him the chosen one before giving him a kiss, which pisses off Misty. We then cut to the ceremony where Melody plays a rendition of Mask Off for everyone. She then runs up to Ash and tells him that as the chosen one, he must travel to the three islands and take the orbs that lie there. Pikachu then steals Ash's hat for some reason, leading him to the first island, which houses the first dragon, I, I mean, orb. Ash ventures there in his friend Marin's boat, but Melody notices how harsh the storm is, and worries for their safety, so she gives chase on a boat of her own with Misty and Tracy in tow. While this is going on, news spreads worldwide about the storm, but this doesn't stop the one responsible for it, as Lawrence sets his sight on his next target, Zapdos. 
The storm rages on, which causes Marin's ship to crash, but this doesn't stop Ash and Pikachu either, who run up to the altar. Shortly thereafter, Melody's ship crashes too. However, in one of the goofiest scenes I've ever witnessed in a movie, she hoists the boat's sail and takes off using the wind's power, effectively flying it up a flight of stairs. Ash, who now having collected the Fire Orb, is face to face with Team Rocket. However, the trio are interrupted when Ash's friends fly in on their magical boat, and Zapdos enters the island, who, according to Meowth, now claims Moltres' island as its own. Within seconds of this revelation, however, Lawrence flies in and drains Zapdos of its energy, before capturing it, as well as Ash and Co. Lawrence then meets with his captives and informs them of his desire to collect Pokemon, which Misty criticises, which is kinda dumb considering the tagline of the franchise and the fact it's basically what all Pokemon trainers do to begin with. You know, collect Pokemon. Lawrence then releases them for some reason before getting back to work and setting his sight on the last legendary bird, Articuno. We then see some news reports which mention many Pokemon are venturing over to Articuno's island, with Oak theorising the legendary trio are somehow involved. By this time, Lawrence III has found Articuno and unleashes a barrage of attacks on the bird, attempting to weaken it for capture. This alerts some strong looking being underwater as it makes its ascent. At the same time, our heroes and Team Rocket are doing the same, but in an attempt to free Zapdos and Moltres. They manage to get Moltres free first, who immediately shoots a fire blast at Zapdos, freeing the electric bird. They then begin to fight in and around the airship, with some of their stray attacks destroying parts of it, which leads to a crash landing on Lightning Island. The group quickly evacuate the ship when it crashes, which upon impact destroys the pedestal, releasing its respective orb which Ash quickly grabs. The gang all hop on Melody's boat, which is carried by some weird tornado to Shmooty Shrine, where they meet the shrine's guardian, Slow King who can talk for some fucking reason. He shows Ash where to place his phase he's collected and as Ash does this, the three birds attempt to attack the shrine before Lugia darts out of the ocean and shields everyone before attempting to fight the trio off. Meanwhile, Lawrence gawks at the legendary Pokemon for a telescope, practically salivating as what he sees as his prize. As Lugia fights off the birds and eventually fails, the Pokemon who are travelling to the island arrive, as the sea is now frozen over, allowing them to cross. To revive him, Melody once again plays Mask Off, and it works, helping the diving Pokemon rise out of the water like a Moltres rising out of the ashes. It can also talk now apparently, as it tells Ash that as the chosen one, he must get the Ice Orb to help Lugia become strong enough to take on the birds. Ash has some doubts that he can do it, but after some motivation from his friends, he pushes on, fighting off the legendaries along the way, but eventually he succumbs to their wrath and is left stranded. That is until Team Rocket makes an unlikely save and helps transport the Chosen One to the shrine. He manages to grab the orb but is attacked by the birds. Thankfully, they all hop onto Lugia managing to get out of there. Team Rocket notice that they're weighing Lugia down, so they decide to let go and sacrifice themselves. Luckily, they end up landing in some water unscathed. Ash then notices all of the Pokemon that have gathered and asks Lugia why they're there, to which Lugia responds with some bullshit about them wanting to help even though they probably can't. Lawrence then makes a Hail Mary attempt to capture Lugia, but he as well as the legendary birds are bodied by one of Lugia's attacks. However, the attack took so much out of Lugia that it leads to the beast plummeting down to earth and landing in the water, consequently taking Ash with him. However, Misty and Tracy are there to fish Ash out of water, who immediately begins to stumble towards the shrine in an attempt to put the final orb among the others. Despite it being a bit of a struggle, he succeeds, and pillars grow out of the ground as Melody busts out her ocarina to play the Song of Storms better than Link ever could, which revives Lugia and causes the legendary birds to settle down. We then treat to a scene of Ash and Pikachu riding on Lugia's back before it drops them off near the shrine and thanks them for their help before disappearing back into the ocean. Shortly after, Delia, Oak and Ivy arrive and Delia immediately starts scolding Ash for making a worry. However, Misty assures her that he's fine and that he did well by saving the world, which leads to a heartfelt little exchange between a mother and a son. We then cut back to Lawrence, who picks up his ancient Mew card from the remains of the ship and decides to continue collecting, but on a smaller scale. Whatever that means. The movie then closes with Team Rocket at Shamuti Shrine, lamenting over the fact that no one saw their heroic acts. However, they're met by Slow King, who breaks the fourth wall and lets them know that a lot of people are watching them right now and saw what they did. And with that, the credits roll. And that's Pokemon 2000, and I've got to say, it was pretty good. At the end of the day, it's still a Pokemon movie, so it's not going to blow your mind or anything, but I'd say it was a good step forward for the Pokemon movies. 
Having said that, you could argue it's worse than the original movie in a sense with how messy the plot can be at times. The plot of the original movie was a lot darker and a lot more of a plodding experience, so to speak, whereas this plot was a lot more skittish and uplifting. Which I'd like to stress isn't necessarily a bad thing, because the message this movie has about self-belief is cool and all, but it has nothing on the original movie and its intense and somewhat complicated themes, which, despite not being super deep, was a lot more of a slow unraveling that paid off big time. The movies are almost incomparable because of how different they are in terms of plot, but from a baseline level, this movie's plot is undoubtedly weaker. I mean, the main villain of the movie, Lawrence III, fades into the background half the time. At least it felt that way to me. On top of that, things seem to happen in quick succession in this movie, giving it some odd pacing, hence my comment about it being skittish earlier, so yeah, I'd definitely say this plot is weaker. I think there were plenty of aspects that I loved, some of which being the constant fourth wall breaking and the fact that Team Rocket actually had an impact on the plot and weren't just included out of obligation like in Mewtwo Strikes Back. Oh, and let's not forget about those funny little fan service moments where Misty freaks out about being called Ash's girlfriend. I bet the shippers loved that. Another pair of great aspects was the sound and visual department. The score really helped set the pace for some of the more intense moments throughout the movie, which I love. And said intense moments were animated beautifully, especially the fight scenes between Lugie and the Bird Trio. It's definitely a step up from the first movie. And with that, I think I've said all I need to say on Pokemon 2000. A solid watch, but I feel like it fell flat in a few areas. Now, how about we have someone who's actually intelligent help me tackle the next movie? Care to introduce yourself? Hey there, I'm Forma. I do video game analysis here on YouTube, and I'm a big fan of the third Pokemon movie. Wow, what a shock! A resident unknown collector is a big fan of the only piece of Pokemon media that actually takes him seriously. Truly, mine is a cursed fate, doomed to roam the ruins of Elf for all eternity. So, Pokemon the Movie 3 Spell of the Unknown Ente what a title that is, opens with a scene of a researcher called Spencer Hale reading stories for and playing around with his daughter Molly, but their fun is cut short as he's emailed by his assistant who asks him to come explore some desert ruins with him, which upsets Molly. But things get even worse for the girl as her father gets sucked into some mysterious dimension inhabited by Unknown while he's exploring said ruins. The next morning, Molly rushes downstairs and is greeted with the bad news that Spencer has vanished. With her mother and father both absent, a despondent Molly starts playing with the unknown tablets left behind. Her strong feelings of sadness cause the tablets to light up and summon the unknown, who start turning her dreams into reality, crystallizing the mansion and summoning an illusory Entei to replace her father. We then cut to our heroes, who run into a trainer called Lisa, who beautifully leads us into our opening credits. The theme used in this opening is a very subtle remix slash reimagining of the original Johto's Journey theme. It doesn't immediately hit you that it's a different theme to the one you hear in the show, since it's only a slight instrumental change with more of a bluesy slash jazz pop fusion feel to it, which surprisingly doesn't stray too far from the pop rocky original. It's very whimsical and laid back, but in the best way possible. I'd definitely recommend giving it a listen if you've never heard it before. I mean, hell, the laid back vibe of the song was so strong that the editors had no choice but to pair it with credits written in Comic Sans. But anyway, once the battle is over, they all sit down for some lunch, and Brock asks Lisa if there's a Pokemon Center nearby, and she tells the gang that there's one in Greenfield, which just so happens to be where Spencer's mansion is. The gang arrives and they're all bewildered by the fact that a large part of the town is crystallised, as a Team Rocket who are surveying the area from some bushes. A local news crew speculates on the cause of the crystallization, pondering if it has something to do with Spencer's disappearance. Meanwhile, Delia is watching the report back in Pallet Town, immediately recognizing the Hale family as longtime friends of her and Professor Oak, who's also watching the broadcast. The two decide to head to Greenfield to see what's happening for themselves. They both arrive while the media is covering the events that are unfolding, and Molly notices Delia on the broadcast and tells Ente that she wants a mum too, to which Ente responds, if that is what you wish, and scurries off. While this is all happening, Delia explains to Ash how she's known Spencer for a long time, since he worked very closely with Oak for a while. 
As she's explaining this, Enter shows up and hypnotizes her before kidnapping her for Molly. However, Pikachu is ready to spring into action and grabs a hold of its mane and attempts to shock the beast, but it's all in vain, as neither he nor Ash can catch up to Entei before it reaches the area that's been covered in crystals, which Brock stops Ash from traversing as he deems it too dangerous. Entei wakes Molly up and presents Delia to her. Molly is overjoyed, asking if they can stay together forever, to which Entei responds, if that is what you wish. Entei shows her the ongoing crystallization, which Molly delights in. Oak explains to the gang that it was an Entei who spirited away Delia, and Spencer's assistant suggests it's the Unknown's doing. Meanwhile, in Charisific Valley, Ash's Charizard spots the newscast of Delia's abduction. We then see a bulldozer attempt to break through the crystal walls that have been erected around the mansion, but it was all for nothing as the Unknown create even more in their place. We then see that Oak has received an email from Molly, where she snaps at everyone to leave her and her parents alone, which puzzles everyone since neither have been seen for a while. Ash decides he's had enough, and storms off to the mansion with Brock and Misty deciding to join him. The gang somehow managed to get in by climbing a small waterfall. I guess Enter was too preoccupied with shooting down Team Rocket to notice them. The news crew reports on the balloon being shot down and happens to spot Noctowl, leading them to show a direct broadcast of Ash's attempts to scale the waterfall. Oak is shocked to see Ash, but not as shocked as Delia, who breaks out of the trance as he stumbles, yelling at him for his recklessness. Now lucid, Delia continues to act compassionately towards Molly, but wonders why she sees her and Entei as her parents. As Ash and Co approach the entrance of Molly's fortress, Ash receives a call from Oak on Lisa's Poke Gear, which she lent him earlier. Oak begins to scold Ash for his foolishness before calming down and realizing the severity of the situation. Skylar then takes over the call, informing Ash that all the weird shit that's been going on is the unknown's doing, as they can use their powers to read thoughts and create alternate realities, theorizing what's been happening is being caused by Molly's wishes. After the call, the group decides to attempt to break into the mansion, enlisting the help of their Pokemon to do so. I thought this little sequence was really cool. It's one of the few things that I think the anime has over the games, and that's showing Pokemon being utilized in unique and creative ways to solve problems. I feel similarly. This moment has always stuck out to me as a particularly clever solution. While climbing a stairwell, it suddenly changes appearance, demonstrating how powerful the unknown's control is within the mansion itself. The group emerges to a grassy field. Molly, watching over the group, is asked if she wants Entei to force them out, but Molly instead wants to have a Pokemon battle with them, doubting whether she's old enough. Entei tells her she can if that is what she wishes, and a contented Molly falls asleep. Entei sinks through the floor in pursuit of the group, with an illusory Molly appearing on his back. Still doubting if she's old enough, Entei tells her she's old enough if she believes she is, turning her into an adult. She and Entei stop the group and challenge them to a battle. Ash is laser focused on getting Delia back, but realizing that Molly won't back down, Brock accepts the challenge to stall for time as the others rush ahead. There's a small bit that got lost in translation here. In the English dub, Molly responds in kind to Brock's flirtation, but in the original she doesn't understand and calls him weird, showing that this is still the child Molly deep down. Brock is an experienced trainer, but experience proves to be no match against Molly's illusory Pokemon. Her tiny Teddy Ursa and Fanpy effortlessly take out Brock's Vulpix and even send the colossal Onyx flying. While this is all going on, Delia and Molly are having a conversation about the storybook Spence used to read, which leads Delia to ask Molly if she ever gets lonely, to which she replies sometimes before quickly assuring her that she no longer feels lonely now that she has a mum and dad. This scene then beautifully transitions into Ash and Misty's encounter with another Molly clone, who once again challenges him to a battle. Misty decides to step forward and mentions that she's a gym leader, which shocks Molly since she always assumed that only adults could be gym leaders. She then decides to turn into 10 year old to match Misty, before this ruling gym leader lays out a rules of only using water Pokemon for this fight, but it doesn't seem to matter much, as Misty's Goldene and Staryu are pretty much dominated by Molly's Kingdra and Mantine. But hey, regardless of the outcomes of these battles, it's pretty cool to see Brock and Misty actually get some time in the spotlight, however brief it may be. Agreed. It helps that they're in dynamic matches with gorgeous environments. The water arena flooding has always been a favorite moment of mine. Ash finally reaches Molly's bedroom, explaining what's going on to his mom and urging her to leave. 
Delia wakes the sleeping Molly and tries to gently explain that she's Ash's mom, not hers, and that they all need to leave to safety. Molly doesn't take this well, crying out and causing huge crystal spikes to separate the three. Ash tries going after his mom, but Entei returns and Molly demands he stop Ash from taking away her mother. Ash refuses to leave without a fight, sending out his best options to try and best the illusion. One by one, though, Entei effortlessly takes them out without a scratch, only being further provoked by Ash's refusal to lose to an illusion. This causes further distortion within the mansion as a blizzard starts and the crystals grow larger. Pikachu is the last one out, dodging Entei's attacks while barely making a scratch on Entei. Amidst all this, Delia realizes Molly is the only one who can stop this and makes her way towards her. Entei then decides to finish off Pikachu, but Ash tries to save him, which only results in both of them being sent flying through a wall. Luckily, every five-year-old's favorite orange dragon swoops in, saving them both from plummeting to their deaths. Charizard and Entei clash, and Charizard gets knocked into Ash, who almost dies again, but is saved by his friends and Team Rocket, who are hiding this whole time. Ash tries to convince Molly to come with them, but she refuses, which prompts Entei to attack. However, Ash dodges and hops onto Charizard's back. He tries his hardest to get into Molly's head that Entei can never be a replacement for a real father, to which Entei responds by exclaiming that he is a real father, if that is what she wishes, before continuing to trade blows with Charizard. Charizard is finally knocked to the ground, and Entei steps on its neck, preparing a killing blow. Before it happens, Molly yells for Entei to stop, overwhelmed by the carnage. The gang praise her for this, telling her she has gym leader level instincts and emphasizing the importance of their mutual love for Pokemon. They encourage her to come with them, and Molly decides she wants everything returns to normal. With the crystal cocoon around the mansion opening up, the crystal spikes disappearing, and the illusory Pokemon disappearing, with Entei to follow. However, it's not over yet. The spikes start to reappear, and back in town, Oak urges the gang to flee as the unknown have lost control, with the Pokemon Center getting engulfed in crystals. Entei leads the group downstairs, protecting them from the growing distortions. The gang arrive at the chamber where the unknown are residing. Ash tries to use his Pokemon to reach them, but fails until Entei lends him a helping hand. However, even he struggles until Molly puts all of her belief into him succeeding, which helps him break through the barrier protecting the unknown. This then leads to a portal opening which the unknown disappear into, not before Entei says his goodbyes to everyone, and expresses what a pleasure it was to be Molly's father. Once the unknown and Entei disappear, the mansion and the surrounding town of Greenfield return to their original states. The unknown return to the ruins, freeing Spencer as they return to their dimension. The gang heads outside the mansion, finally able to appreciate the natural beauty of Greenfield. Molly looks up at the sky, quietly thanking Entei for everything. As the credits roll, all the loose threads get tied up nicely as Spencer returns home, Charizard and Lisa part ways from the gang, and Molly even gets reunited with her real mother in the end. I've got to say, those credits were a great idea. For some reason, it feels a lot more powerful having stuff like that play out silently during a credit sequence than if they actually added some dialogue and just crammed it in at the end. It feels like the icing on the cake that is this movie, and I have to say, to my surprise, I think I totally prefer this to the first two movies. Which was surprising, especially with the first movie and all the nostalgia I have for it. But the way this movie tells its story and makes its themes present, but not in your face, was something I found so enchanting. My preconception was, it's a movie centered around one of the most useless Pokemon, how good can it be? But that was slowly chipped away at as the movie progressed, till it was completely shattered at the end, and I had no choice but to submit and admit to myself that it's a damn good movie. That's not to say it's without faults. Initially, I found some of the dialogue and delivery to be a little odd, as well as the early pacing to be a little rushed and janky at times. However, this was made up for by the fact that the secondary characters got a chance to shine. We've already mentioned Brock and Misty, but god damn, Team Rocket! A round of applause for the writers for this one, they knocked it out of the park with these guys. Anytime Team Rocket decides to open their mouth, it's some witty one-liner or fourth wall break, 
and I'm a huge fan. It was probably my favourite part of the movie if I'm honest. I've been flapping my gum so much, I completely forgot to ask you what you think about the movie for me. A rewatch has definitely cemented this as my favourite Pokemon movie. Its character driven plot really works wonders to connect basically any kind of viewer to its emotional centre. Adults can empathize with the tough realities of losing a loved one and the demands of work keeping you away from family when you're needed most, while kids can empathize with Molly's loneliness and need for her family, as well as Ash's determination to rescue his mother. The imagination of a young child given form is such an excellent concept. It really allows them to go wild in terms of setting and visuals, and it lets them subtly explore Molly's fears and desires in a way other movies couldn't. That's an excellent observation, I think that's one of the things that drew me in, while simultaneously going over my head. This plot is really complex. Okay, we're not talking some complex, multi-layered, mind-numbing, breaking bad shit here, but considering the depth the Pokemon anime usually strives for, it's pretty impressive what they managed to pull off. Also, on the topic of visuals, I think this movie is beautiful. The use of special effects and CGI is a lot better than the previous movies. It also helps that this is the first, and one of very few Pokemon movies to have a smaller scale plot without world ending stakes involved. The smaller scale, and especially the lower number of unique Pokemon, seems to have let the artists make more elaborate set pieces. Molly's story arc is overall well executed. Her character growth between closing herself off after a tragic loss and gradually opening up with the support of others was explored really well, and the visual design did a lot of heavy lifting to emphasize that. The ending is a bit saccharine, but it's appropriate for Pokemon, and the payoff does feel well earned. Well, I guess that's that. It was a pleasure having you on, Former. You've been a great co-host. It's been a pleasure working with you. Till next time. Okay, now that I'm alone, let's not waste any more time and get straight into Pokemon Forever. The movie begins with an insane sequence involving a Celebi being chased and attacked by a Cypher and a Houndoom. I love this shot, it's beautifully animated and really tense. It got me into the movie immediately. I really enjoy when movies and games pull off powerful moments without dialogue, and while maybe not the strongest example of it, this opening scene is still a good one. Turns out this scene is taking place 40 years ago, as we transition to a different scene, this time focusing on a kid called Sam. Sam gets stopped mid-exploration by some girl who gives him some bread, while telling him to keep an ear out for the voice of the forest or some shit. Turns out the supposed voice of the forest is Celebi, who Sam ends up running into and saves from Pokemon trying to attack it. Pokemon who apparently belong to a Pokemon Poacher. The Poacher won't give up though, and this eventually forces Celebi to use its voice to help it time travel and save itself, taking Sam with it. This brings us to present day, where the very same Poacher is getting thrown around by a Team Rocket goon called the Iron Masked Marauder. I'll be honest, it, it took me way too long to notice the R on his chest and make the link. But anyway, the Marauder asks a Poacher to tell him where he saw the Celebi all those years ago, but he won't budge. This annoys the Rocket Goon, so he decides to use a Dark Ball on a timid, anemic looking Tyranitar that the Poacher had captured. After he catches a Pokemon, he immediately lets it back out and makes it destroy the Poacher's base, which eventually makes the Poacher fold. We then cut to our traditional opening credit sequence featuring our heroes, this time with a remix of the theme song Born To Be A Winner. I always remembered liking this song, but after listening to it again for this video, I realised how much is just straight up wrong with the song, chief among them being that goofy ass bass line. Thankfully the remix fixes a lot, the vocal performance is better, both the melody and bass line are better incorporated in the overall package, and they included a solo to fill in what was basically empty space in the original. All in all, a solid rendition that matches up really well with the mini battle sequence and the tension of Ash trying to catch the ferry. Speaking of which, it's on this ferry ride the gang catch a glimpse of Suicune, who they learn more about after consulting Oak. Following the brief interaction, they press on in a speedboat, while being watched by Team Rocket as always. They eventually arrive at the same forest Sam was exploring all those years ago, receiving the same warning Sam did from that girl called Toa. 
Only this time she's much older and has a granddaughter, Diana. Ash and Cole kinda just brush off the warning and head into the forest anyway, seeing a bright flash once they get deeper. They decide to investigate and find Sam unconscious, and decide to rush him back to Toa. When he comes to, he has a little scuffle with Ash, but calms down after Toa recognises him. A little later, Sam remembers Celebi and decides to go look for it, since he fears it might still be somewhere in the forest, suffering from its injuries. With the help of Ash, Brock and Misty, he eventually tracks down the Pokemon, but the reunion is short-lived because Iron Mask pops up out of nowhere and tries to steal Celebi. However, Celebi is saved by Team Rocket as a result of their selfishness, wanting to be the ones to steal Celebi, although, as you could probably guess, this doesn't last long as they almost instantly bend the knee to the glorified Poacher, who sends a Sneasel and Scizor after Ash and friends. The evil Pokemon end up finding our heroes, but are bested after a short battle, and are subsequently tied up. This allows our heroes to find the Lake of Life, in which they baptise Celebi to revive it, which then leads to some cute little moments of everyone hanging out being best buds. The next day, everyone decides to head back to the village, but on the way, they're attacked by Team Rocket and their new overlord. They make an attempt to fight them off, but during the chaos, Celebi is captured using a dark ball. Ash and some of the Pokemon who live in the forest try to make a last-ditch effort to save the Time Traveler, but to no avail, as Celebi has already been corrupted and begins to attack everyone, before building a giant nest out of parts of the surrounding woodlands, which Jesse ends up being sucked into. During the commotion, Diana flies over in a blimp to scoop up Ash and his pals, with James and Meowth latching on for a free ride too. We then cut to Celebi, who at the behest of Iron Mask, undergoes some kind of transformation into a Final Fantasy boss made of grass and tree bark. After transforming, the forest monster fires at the blimp, sending everyone plummeting down to Earth. Once a gang lands, they try to fight off the beast, but it's too strong and retaliates with an attack of its own. Luckily, Suicune swoops in and saves Ash and Sam. Iron Mask sees this as an opportunity to add another rare Pokemon to his collection and sends out his Tyranitar to weaken the legendary beast, but it's intercepted by Brock Sonix. This gives Suicune a window of opportunity to get to Celebi. This results in a bit of a tussle between Suicune and Celebi, which results in Ash and Sam falling off Suicune's back. Luckily, Jesse grabs a hold of both of them and directs them to where Celebi is, and after some internal conflict, Dark Celebi returns to normal. This causes a weird monster's exterior to crumble, but everyone manages to get out of there unscathed. Except for our little fairy friend, who begins to wither away in Ash's arms. They all try to revive it using the lake, but it doesn't work since it was contaminated by a blast it set off while under the hunter's influence. Thankfully, all is not lost, as Suicune manages to use its powers to purify the lake, which means Celebi can be revived. Or so we thought. The lake doesn't do much to help Celebi, and despite Ash's best efforts, there's seemingly nothing they can do to revive the fallen legendary. But just as all hope seems lost, a portal opens up in the sky, and a bunch of Celebi start flying out of it. They all lift up the fallen comrade and use their powers to revive it which leads to the inevitable joyous scene of everyone celebrating Celebi's revival. Unfortunately, the celebration is cut short when Iron Mask pops up and tries to capture Celebi the old-fashioned way, but unfortunately for him, Ash and Pikachu stop him before he can get away. We're then treated to a heartfelt farewell between Sam and Ash, which we later see Ash venting to Professor Oak about over the phone. However, Oak assures Ash that he and Sam will always be friends before hanging up. This puzzles Misty as Ash never mentioned Sam by name, but he and his friends brush it off as they move on with their adventure. We then see Oak open up a sketchbook with a drawing of Pikachu and Celebi together, revealing that Oak and Sam are one in the same. This should have been a very cool way to end the movie, but instead they went with a scene of Team Rocket messing around, as well as showing the audience what happened to the Hunter's Pokemon. But either way, it's a very cool moment, however... It doesn't make me love the movie by any stretch. That's not to say I don't like Forever, it's a solid watch and in many ways I prefer it to 2000, but holy shit was I bored upon my first watch. I grew to appreciate it on my second watch, but it still didn't really do much for me. Sure, there were some good moments, like all that cute shit with Celebi, but I feel like some of the more emotional moments didn't feel earned, but maybe that's just me. And on top of that, you have the occasional odd choice in terms of progression, like that weird, long, drawn-out escorting scene where the forest Pokemon show Ash and his friends where the lake is. Or this weird filter during the Butterfree scene, which I like to call the dirty glasses scene. Those of you who wear glasses will know what I'm on about. And going back to Sam, while the revelation that he's a younger Oak adds a little more dimension to his personality, 
It doesn't change the fact that throughout the movie, he feels like nothing but a boring Ash clone. Although, maybe that was a stylistic choice to exemplify the fact that he's not that seasoned researcher who's lived a life yet. It's a real shame because the opening scene is incredible, but it feels like the movie goes up and down like a wave after that. But hey, let's hope I prefer the next movie on the list, Pokemon Heroes. Heroes starts with a scene introducing our villains for the movie, Annie and Oakley, a pair of Team Rocket members that make my penis feel funny for some reason. They both steal a book from a library which apparently gives them some vital information on two things that they want to get a hold of, the Soul Do and something called the Defense Mechanism of Ultimar, or DMA for short. We then cut to, you guessed it, the opening credits featuring the Master Quest theme. Although interestingly there are two things that separate this opening from the others, the first being this is a first not to feature battling of any kind, and instead features a race using water Pokemon. The other being the theme isn't remixed or remade, but instead, the movie uses a full version of the original theme. Not that I'm complaining, Believe In Me is a great song, and is arguably the only song from this era of the anime to rival the original theme in terms of quality and replayability, and if you don't believe me, just give it a listen. This full version definitely helps set a great tone for the rest of the movie, as well as aiding the race scene itself with its great instrumentation and awesome solo which adds a great level of intensity. In case you haven't noticed at this point, I'm a big fan of solos. Speaking of which, it's actually during the sequence we're introduced to the legendaries of this movie, Latias and Latios, who attempt to aid Ash and his Totodile in the race, only to go a little overboard which gives Misty and Acorsola a chance to win instead. After picking up a win, Misty gets the offer to be shown around by the runner-up of the competition, Ross, an offer she gladly accepts. And while the gang are being shown around and are getting the law down on the local law courtesy of Ross, our two Team Rocket spies are surveying the area, looking for one of the Latty twins who has taken a human form. They spot their target and speed off in their boat, splashing Jesse, James and Meowth on the way there. James recognises them and the trio decide to follow them and take them out so they can take the credit for whatever they're scheming. We then cut back to Ash and crew who are going to get some ice cream of their own, but Pikachu gets sidetracked and decides to drink from a water pump. A girl helps Pikachu turn the pump on and, as it so happens, this girl is actually Latias in disguise. Latias runs off after Ash shows up to call Pikachu over, but she doesn't get too far as Annie and Oakley are hiding just around the corner and decide to attack her. Pikachu hears a skirmish and decides to spring into action. They end up saving the legendary, who then directs them back to where they were earlier, before disappearing. Ash kinda just brushes it off and continues exploring Ultima with his pals, eventually finding himself in a museum. It's at this museum where he notices a girl who resembles Latias's human form, who he chases and asks why she ran away, to which she responds, I don't know ya, but Ash being Ash, continues following her until he runs into the real Latias, who guides him to a secret area. There he sees a bunch of Pokemon playing around enjoying themselves, as well as Latias playing on a swing. Before he can approach her though, the other half of the Eon duo comes darting out of the water and attacks him. However, before any serious damage can be done, Latias steps in, before the girl who looks identical to a human form pops up out of nowhere and starts acting all aggressive. The owner of the museum, Lorenzo, then pops up and tells everyone to calm down. Everyone then gets to know each other and runs around having fun, while this weird sounding pop song that kinda sounds like a rip off Can You Feel The Sunshine sung in English plays in the background. That's not to say it's the worst song in the world or anything like that, it certainly has its charm, with the weird pronunciation of words and the odd accent paired with the dreamy instrumental, it almost has a mystical edge to it. Which in all honesty is quite befitting of a scene where the Eon duo use their powers to project their vision through the human's eyes while they glide through the water. It's a much better implementation of pop music in a movie than Brother My Brother, I'll say that much. Anyway, later that night we see Annie and Oakley heading somewhere with Jesse, James and Meowth, trying their best to follow them, only to fail. Turns out the pair found where the Latty twins are and after taking out Lorenzo, they head inside the secret garden and come face to face with the twins. Despite the Eon Duo's best efforts, the spies overpower them, managing to catch Latios, who sacrifices himself to save Latias. Oakley then pries a Soldu from the altar which lies within the garden, and then notices some etchings on the floor which, after being scanned, are revealed to be some info on the DMA. They both dart off to the museum and upon arrival, toss Latios into the DMA to power it, 
Lorenzo and Bianca then turn up after noticing the absence of the soul do. However, they're easily taken care of, allowing Oakley to place a gem in the DMA, bringing it to its full power. Meanwhile, Latias visits a Pokemon Center to find Ash to ask for his help and using the sight sharing powers shows Ash and the gang what's going on in the museum, as we see Lorenzo pleading with Oakley to not get into the DMA. She ignores his pleas and decides to resurrect a pair of fossil Pokemon to hunt down Latias, before triggering a city-wide lockdown. Unfortunately for her, Ash narrowly avoids being shut in and decides to confront her and Annie. The fossils try to stop him on the way, but thanks to the efforts of Brock and Misty's Pokemon, he manages to press on. But when he arrives outside the museum, Oakley summons a wave with the DMA to try and stop him. Latias manages to destroy the wave, which results in Oakley's machine going haywire. At which point Ash storms in to free Bianca and Lorenzo, as Latias tries her best to save Latios. And after a bit of a struggle, they succeed, which calms down the DMA, but only for a little while as Annie, while checking up on a friend, decides to touch the soul do, which has turned a blackish purple. This sets off the device once more, and leads to all of the water in Ultima disappearing, before returning in the form of a massive tidal wave. The Eon Duo sense a threat and spring into action, joining their powers to stop the tsunami. The duo manage to quell the water's frenzy and bring everything back to normal, However, this cost Latios his life, which our heroes learn as they go out in search of the twins. Despite the somber moment, Latias gives everyone a bit of closure with the use of sight sharing, as she shows them everything from Latios' perspective one last time. Bianca then receives a new soul do, which she puts in the place of the old one. The next day, Ash, Brock and Misty decide to head out on a boat and say their goodbyes to everyone. However, Bianca isn't anywhere to be found, until the last minute when she gives Ash a little kiss on the cheek along with a drawing of him and Pikachu. And with that, the credits roll. So, how do I feel about Heroes? Well, in all honesty, it might have been one of the ones I like the most. Maybe even as much as the first movie, which is saying a lot. The pacing felt great, the movie had the best use of CG so far, and the setting and soundtrack were pretty nice, giving off a vaguely Mediterranean vibe. Of course, there are some complaints, but they could be seen as nitpicks at most. Stuff like the weird silent opening that goes on for two minutes, and the fact that Team Rocket are in the movie just because, and not because they actually add anything to it. But overall, I'd say Heroes was a solid time. It was almost boringly solid. Solid to the point where I don't really have much more to say about it, so let's take a quick breather and reflect. Heroes was the last of what was considered the original series, at least in terms of movies. Original series meaning the Gen 1, Orange Islands and Gen 2 anime, or as some may refer to it, the Misty Era. And now having finally watched the original series of movies and venturing beyond Mewtwo Strikes Back, I can say definitively that the OG movies were decent. Not mind-blowing, but decent. I feel like in some ways 2000 and the Unknown movie went a little overboard and were a little more complex, whereas Forever and Heroes kept it a little more streamlined. And if you ask me, I definitely prefer the latter approach. I mean, Heroes is almost on the same level as the first movie for me, which is saying a lot. But having said that, I feel like the movies could do or be so much more. I know I'm talking about the Pokemon anime here, but I feel like the movies could be improved in some way, but I'm not entirely sure how because I'm not a movie critic and I'm not well versed enough in the medium to say. But anyway, this video is probably going to end up being like 5 hours long, so let's not waste any more time. Here are my current rankings and let's jump head first into the advanced generation. We begin the advanced generation with Jirachi Wishmaker a movie starring one of my favourite legendaries, so needless to say, I had some high expectations considering it's starring one of my favourite legendaries and how good some of the past movies were. And speaking of legendaries, that's the first thing we see, a little homage to all of the movies that have come before, which is some pretty sweet fan service. This whole scene goes beyond fan service though, as it's important to the plot, since it has our usual narrator talking to us about the bond between humans and Pokemon and all of that good shit before going on to explain how some tried to use Pokemon for evil. Namely, Team Magma, who want to use the legendary Pokemon Groudon to fulfil their own goals and ambitions. However, they aren't the only ones looking for the continent Pokemon, as there's a mysterious man who's also looking for it, but ends up finding something else in its place. 
The narrator then leaves us with a cryptic little message about how you should be careful what you wish for. We then see Ash, Brock, May and Max heading to the site of a festival celebrating the arrival of the Millennium Comet, which, as the name suggests, arrives once every thousand years and is only visible for seven nights. Unfortunately for Ash and friends, the site seems to be bare with not a person in sight, so they decide to camp out for the night and resume their search tomorrow. Luckily for them, they were right about the festival's location, as trucks pull up during the night, waking them up as they bear witness to the spectacle that is the setup of the festival itself. This old sequence actually features as the opening credits for the movie, and I'm disappointed to report this is the first movie to not feature a theme song, instead opting for a weird, almost mystical instrumental. The composition kind of reminds me of the questionnaire theme from the Mystery Dungeon games, but I've got to say it's pretty fitting considering what we're seeing on screen. But I'd be lying if I said I wasn't disappointed that the theme song I Wanna Be A Hero wasn't featured at all. Hell, it never even got a full version or remix. All we have is the original intro version from the Pokemon Advance anime, which clocks in at just under a minute in length. It makes me sad we never got a better or more full version, but it's whatever, I guess. Once everything is set up, our heroes go around checking out the attractions, including a magic show starring the great butler, who you'll recognise as a man who's after Groudon. At least I didn't try and hide the fact he's a villain of the movie. During Butler's performance, Max starts to hear voices talking about a comet, which is apparently coming from a giant crystal Butler's assistant Diane is carrying. Ash follows his friend on stage and apologises for his foolishness, but Butler being a showman, spins this intrusion and makes it seem like it's part of the show, as he uses Ash and Max for his next trick. The trick goes well, but Team Rocket decide to swipe Pikachu and some of the performer Pokemon while everyone has their guard down. Unfortunately for them, Butler's Dust Clops puts an end to their shenanigans, as the crowd cheers everyone on, believing Team Rocket to be part of the show. Once the show wraps up, Butler tells Max that the voice coming from The Rock is a Pokemon called Jirachi, who awakens once every millennium when two conditions are met. The Millennium Comet must be visible, and Jirachi must find a friend. And judging from what the voice was saying to him earlier, it appears Max has already been chosen as its friend, so he accepts the responsibility of such a role with open arms. Later we see the gang checking out the festival stalls and something catches May's eye. The store owner tells her it's a wish maker, an item that'll grant any wish as long as May closes one of its flaps every night the comet is out. Shortly thereafter, the festival closes down for the night as everyone stares up at the sky as the comet comes into view. Max begins to drift off as May sings him a lullaby but is awoken by a strange light emitting from the crystal, indicating Jirachi's arrival which alerts Diane as well as a random absol somewhere in the wild. Diane offers to let the group stay in a bus for the night before running off to tell Butler, who's understandably ecstatic about the news. Back on the bus, Max decides to ask Jirachi for a bunch of candy. His wish is granted, but it causes a bit of a ruckus, as the candy is actually from a local stall. The gang decide to take it back themselves since Jirachi is unable as he's dozed off, needing to recharge his energy. The next day, we see a short scene play out with Max and his new pal enjoying each other's company, as Team Rocket look on from a distance, plotting to kidnap the legendary. I'd like to highlight one of my highlights for this movie, that being Max and Jirachi's friendship. It's undoubtedly my favourite part. It's just so heartwarming to see them both hit it off immediately and become best friends. It adds somewhat of a slice of life aspect to this movie, not really present in the others, past the occasional montage. Anyway, we then cut to a scene of everyone helping Butler and Diane set up their next show, but they're interrupted by the Absol from earlier. The gang try to fight off Absol, however, Jirachi makes Ash's Pikachu and May's Torchic disappear for whatever reason, giving Absol free reign to attack our heroes. Luckily, Butler has a trick up his sleeve, as he uses a trap door to capture the Pokemon. We then cut to later that night. May's pushing down the second flap of the Wishmaker when she notices Butler leaving the bus where everyone is sleeping. Turns out he stole a Jirachi to fulfil his goal of sticking it to Team Magma and reviving Groudon, since they humiliated him when he failed to do so in the past. While he steals Jirachi's energy for the resurrection, May wakes up her friends notifying them of the Wish Pokemon's absence. They all run to Butler's tent where they find a distressed Jirachi who's injured itself after setting off an involuntary blast. However, some good came from the ordeal, as it's now free from Butler's machine, giving Max a chance to take off with a mythical Pokemon with the help of Absol and Diane, who seemingly wanted no part in Butler's scheme from the very start. 
As our heroes drive off in their bus, Butler's Mighty Enna gives chase, managing to attach a tracking device to the vehicle. Blissfully unaware of this fact, the party set off for Farina, the place where the evil magician originally found Jirachi. We're then treated to a travel montage, as well as some of Butler's backstory, courtesy of Diane. We learn that she and the magician have known each other since they were young, but as mentioned before, sometime down the road, he decided to get involved with Team Magma only to embarrass himself, which gave him a bit of a chip on his shoulder. We also get some more Max and Jirachi moments, which is nice, but as the nights roll by, it's becoming more and more apparent Max isn't ready to say goodbye, even after being consoled by both Ash and May on separate occasions. This reaches its climax once the party arrives at Farina, as Max begins to cry and ask Jirachi not to leave, however, the mythical Pokemon says it must, as it opens its true eye to absorb the comet's power. But just as we thought Jirachi was home free, some spikes come out of the wall surrounding Jirachi and capture him. Butler then reveals himself as he begins to drain Jirachi's power to resurrect the crowd on. Ash and Max, with the help of Absol and a wild Flygon, manage to free Jirachi without too much struggle, but it's too late as a beastly being known as Metagroudon rises from the ground, using the energy of the surrounding area to fuel itself, which causes trees and flowers to decay. Butler is absolutely distraught by this, as he realises what he created isn't Groudon, but a gross, monstrous copy. Metagroudon begins to consume the wild Pokemon of Farina for energy, using its weird luminescent tentacles to do so. In the process, it absorbs May, Brock, Diane and Team Rocket, who are watching the spectacle from a distance. During the commotion, Butler figures out a way to make the beast disappear, but needs the cooperation of Ash and his pals. They agree, and after narrowly avoiding death a handful of times, they manage to start the machine and get Jirachi in it, so he can take out Meta Groudon. The monster puts up a fight, but eventually falls, thanks to the efforts of our heroes. The wild Pokemon are freed, Diane and Butler are reunited, and so are our heroes, who get to say their final goodbyes to Jirachi, and with that, the credits roll. So, Jirachi Wishmaker. A very odd movie, I must admit. While in some ways it feels like more of the same when compared to its predecessors, in others, it feels like a breath of fresh air. I think we have the aforementioned friendship between Max and Jirachi to thank for the freshness. It was a nice change of pace having a more slice of life feel. However, the movie did feel a little tired to me, like it was a retread of old material. I think it's because the filmmakers were aiming for a best of of the past five movies. Wishmaker carries over the drama from the first three movies, while giving us more of that streamlined experience present in Forever and Heroes. And while it works and gives us plenty of great moments like the birth of False Crowd on, it also shows how repetitive the formula is getting only six movies in. And that's even with the vastly different stories and themes carried throughout each of the movies. But I'll give Wishmaker respect where it's due. It's a fun and light hard watch, if nothing else. Now, let's see how the rest of the Gen 3 movies stack up. Our next movie, Destiny Deoxys, begins with yet another This is a World of Pokemon speech. This time, setting up the arrival of the DNA Pokemon Deoxys on planet Earth. Yet again, there's no opening theme, instead getting straight into the thick of things, which I didn't mind since it helped the movie's pacing greatly. Still, it would have been nice to hear a more full version of the overly chipper This Dream. Speaking of getting into the thick of things, after the little intro plays, we're introduced to the main character of this movie, Tori. Tori is a young boy who's accompanying his father, Professor Lund, on an expedition, and he seems like a very happy child but that all changes as soon as the meteor housing Deoxys lands. As soon as it lands, it creates a shockwave, causing the ground under Tori to crumble, resulting in him slipping into a herd of scared Celio and Walrein who are running for their lives. This traumatises the young boy so much, he faints on the spot, but luckily his dad and his dad's assistant Yuko are there to get him out of harm's way. As they get the boy to higher ground, they notice something awakening from the meteor, and it's none other than the extraterrestrial Pokemon, Deoxys. The alien uses its powers to unearth some kind of green gem from the snow and starts using it to... I don't know, meditate? Before we get to see what it was actually doing with the gem, Rayquaza pops up and starts attacking Deoxys, believing it to be encroaching on its territory. During the wonderfully animated tussle, all of the researcher's equipment is destroyed, and all of Professor Lund's team is forced to flee. After trading some serious blows, Deoxys is bested by a point-blank hyper beam from Rayquaza, 
leading to the alien changing into a gem itself before sinking to the bottom of the ocean. Four years later, we see that Professor Lund has taken the green gem back to his lab and is currently conducting experiments on it, which is causing it to glow, which in turn reawakens Deoxys. While this is all going on, we see a slightly older Tori running around in a greenhouse, talking to something, but it's not entirely apparent what it is. We then see Ash and friends on a monorail as they arrive in LaRue City, a place that is extremely high tech. We're then treated to a brief but cute scene of a puzzle and Minan playing around together while the Munchlax watches on. Once our heroes enter the city station, they're greeted by a security robot which takes their pictures and presents them with passports, which are used to make a bunch of the stuff in the city function. Leaving the station, Ash has his sights set on a place called the Battle Tower, but he's so concerned with getting some matches in that he doesn't notice the moving sidewalks which carry him away. This is when we meet some of the side characters for this movie. Rafe, a cocky trainer who's accompanied by his two sisters, Audrey and Catherine, Sid, a fat guy whose entire personality is the fact that he has a thing for May, and Rebecca. She's basically just your typical nerdy character that analyzes everything. Rafe sends his Blaziken to help Ash off the sidewalk, and the two groups of trainers get to know each other on the way to the battle tower. Once there, Ash leaves his friends to go find the registration desk. Unable to find it, he asks the boy for directions. This boy just so happens to be Tori, who gets scared by Pikachu and runs away. But in another instance of Ash being Ash, he gives chase, which inadvertently leads to the pair getting entered in a double battle against Rafe and Sid. It's during this battle that it's revealed that Tori doesn't know how to battle, since he's scared of Pokemon, and despite Ash's best efforts to compensate for this fact, they still end up losing. After the battle, Tori's dad congratulates him for taking part, but Tori seems upset by the whole ordeal and just runs off. Yuko then explains to the group that Tori was traumatized by his experience during the meteor crash. Ash then decides to help Tori overcome his fear and goes to look for him. He ends up finding him helping out the Minon from earlier get out of a trash can it's stuck in. The Minon tries to thank Tori with a hug, but he runs away scared and decides to head to the greenhouse with Ash following closely behind. Tori calls his friend out so he can talk to them and turns out this friend is some weird floating sprite pixie thing, for lack of a better description. He tells a sprite about what just happened, but is interrupted by Ash, who asks him who he's talking to. He continuously bugs him, and after a couple of close encounters with a flock of Wingull and Pikachu, Tori snaps and pushes Ash, trying to get away from him. This annoys Ash, who grips him by the collar and demands answers, but May, Brock and Max pop up out of nowhere and put a stop to the altercation. After things simmer down a bit, Brock cooks some food for everyone, and during the meal, Ash tries to get Tori to pet Pikachu, but still not over his trauma, he scurries off once more. We then see Deoxys, who arrived in the city earlier, destroy a fountain for some reason before creating a massive purple aurora in the sky. Ash and his friends marvel at the spectacle, not realising where it's coming from, but Rebecca points out that it's odd that they can see an aurora, considering where they are geographically. Everyone kind of brushes it off and just enjoys their time together to the theme song of sorts to this movie, This Side of Paradise. While the Pokemon Advance Challenge theme isn't used, it's almost replaced by this song in a way. This Side of Paradise is used multiple times throughout the movie in multiple ways, and it works quite well. It's just an uplifting song used in happy and triumphant moments. There's not much else to it. Although here's a fun fact, this song was sung by an artist called Bree Sharp, who also sung the theme for the English Tokyo Mew Mew dub. Anyway, while everyone is playing, having a good time, the Aurora disappears, as Deoxys is seen attacking some random Pokemon who are just minding their own business, which somehow alerts Rayquaza, who's chilling all the way up in the ozone layer. We're then treated to a short scene where Tori vents to Ash about how he doesn't have many friends due to his fear of Pokemon and tries to buck up the courage to pet Pikachu but is jump scared by Corfish who comes out of nowhere. Despite this setback, he feels comfortable around his new friends and decides to introduce them to his only prior friend. Everyone is wowed by the existence of this odd little sprite, but before they can even figure out what it is, disaster strikes as Rayquaza makes its descent. This alarms not only the police force and Professor Lund, but also Deoxys, who creates a force field around the city to keep the dragon out, while it clones itself and starts abducting people and Pokemon, as well as tampering with the city's electronics. This includes passports, which means Ash and his pals are stuck in the greenhouse. 
Sid and his Blastoise manage to pry the door open, but this ends up being a mistake, as they're both kidnapped by Deoxys clones. Luckily, the rest of the gang manage to escape to an underground tunnel, thanks to Tori's quick thinking. They end up getting to where Yuko's hiding now, and she gives them the lowdown on the current state of LaRousse. As she's explaining this, the gang hears some rustling in a nearby vent, which scares them, but it turns out to be Plusle, Minon, and Munchlax, who had a close encounter with the Deoxys themselves. Everybody realises they'll probably need food and water if they're gonna hide out for a while, so a few of our heroes head out to look for some supplies. But as you would probably expect, they're attacked by Deoxys clones, and during the fight, Minon is captured. As well as the hot dog machine the gang were raiding for some reason. Back at the hideout, everyone's getting some rest, but they're woken by some invading clones. Luckily, there are no more losses to the party, as everyone manages to get further underground to the lab where Lund was conducting his research. It's here where Yuko explains that the green crystal she and Professor Lund found is in fact another Deoxys in a dormant state. As she's explaining this, Tori's friend pops out of the gem and begins communicating with the group. Turns out both of the Deoxys are friends, and were trying to find one another this whole time, and the kidnappings only happened so they could avoid interference and detect one another. Everyone then puts their heads together and hatch a plan to bring power back to the city so that they can revive the second Deoxys. This is put into motion the next day. During a confrontation, Wraith purposefully gets abducted so he can tamper with something on the inside, while Ash and Tori blast the outside with electric attacks to open the doors of the dome, freeing everyone inside. However, unbeknownst to the liberated citizens, Wikwaza has finally broken through Deoxys' barrier and has begun to fight with the alien, after taking out every single one of its clones. While the legendaries battle it out, the people and Pokemon of LaRousse work together to get some wind turbines moving, so they can generate enough electricity to reawaken Deoxys' friend. And it's a success, which is certainly a good thing, as the green core Deoxys stops the fight between Rayquaza and the purple core Deoxys, leading to a heartfelt reunion between the pair of extraterrestrials. But as to be expected, it's short-lived, as Rayquaza, who is being bested by the purple Deoxys, comes back with a vengeance, attacking the duo. This alerts the security robots who are now active again. They end up going into overdrive and begin to consume Rayquaza, as well as the Deoxys duo who try to help. They then go on to engulf entire buildings before Ash puts a stop to it all by presenting a passport to the main security bot, making the city's security system go back to normal. Ash and Tori are both really happy with the outcome, but all of a sudden Plusle and Minon slip and fall off a massive pile of robots. Tori jumps down after them, grabbing them both, finally having gotten over his fear. The three of them are then saved from falling to the death by one of the Deoxys. The duo then take Ash and Tori back to their friends, as Yuko and Lund come running towards Tori to check on him. While the youngster is reassuring his dad, his new friends Puzzle and Minon hop on his shoulders, which completely takes Lund aback, almost reducing him to tears. The legendaries then say their goodbyes to the group as they take their leave and the credits roll. I've got to say, this was the perfect ending for this movie. I've come to expect very little in terms of stuff that will actually move me in these movies, but Tori's character arc came very close. Don't get it twisted, I wasn't on the floor sobbing or anything like that, but his character arc was more well written than it had any right to be. The exploration of childhood trauma through the heavily filtered and colourful world of Pokemon doesn't sound good on paper, but in execution, it worked very well. I don't want to paint Tori like he's the anime version of N or anything like that, but he certainly is the best part of this movie, and possibly up there with characters like Paul for being some of the greatest characters the anime has to offer. And his arc is aided exponentially by how good the rest of the movie is. Staying on the topic of story, the movie is a fantastic marriage of gags, action, and slice of life. There's definitely something for everyone here, regardless of taste, and if you like those things, you'll like it even more because it gives a flick such a fast pace and exciting feel. It makes the film feel like an extended episode of the anime, rather than something independent of the anime like some of the movies I've covered thus far. And it's obvious a lot of this was thought out and on purpose, because stuff that would have been throwaway filler in other Pokemon movies, such as getting passports, actually ends up being important to the plot. 
Not to mention the dynamic between the legendaries. Throughout the movie, you never really know who you should be rooting for because both legendaries are our souls, while also being in the right to a degree, each having legitimate reasons for fighting. Such strong and well thought out storytelling definitely makes this a favourite movie of mine. Another thing that makes this a favourite is the visual aspect. I don't know what it is, perhaps an advancement in tech, but this is the most vibrant film so far. The colours really pop and give everything such a nice look. As does the liberal use of CG. This is an excellent incorporation of CGI. Some could argue the movie uses it as a crutch at points, but I think it only enhances the experience, making the movie feel a lot more alive, even if it looks a little dated by today's standards. God, I could really go on gushing about this movie, but I'll spare you guys. I'll just put it out there and say this is my new favourite Pokemon movie, but let's see if Lucario and the Mystery of Mew can dethrone it. This is one of the few Pokemon movies I was excited to get to, since this movie in particular seems to have gained a level of acclaim among fans over the years. Of course, the others have their fans too, but this is one of the movies that seems to stand above the others as well. A standout. Maybe it's to do with Lucario being a fan favourite Pokemon, or perhaps it's the return of Mew that sells people on this flick. Who knows? Regardless, this movie opens with Lucario running around a valley of some kind, using its aura powers to survey the area. On either side of it, it sees two armies, one clad in red and the other in green, both comprised of a mix of humans and Pokemon, no doubt about to engage in all-out war with one another. Lucario is then suddenly attacked by a trio of Houndoom from the Red Army. He manages to make his escape and touches a crystal to communicate with his master, Sir Aaron who bears a striking resemblance to Riley. The Aura Pokemon warns his master that his Queen's Castle is in danger, which leads to Aaron taking a ride atop his Pidgeot to go solve the problem himself. The Houndoom then catch up with Lucario, forcing him to fight, but during the commotion, he gets some dirt in his eyes, forcing him to use his Aura powers to see. The Pokemon catches up to his master, who is now in the vicinity. Aaron tells him to leave the area and informs him that he's abandoned his queen and castle. This shocks Lucario, who is subsequently trapped within Aaron's staff as the knight scurries off, leaving his partner feeling betrayed as he begins to drift off to sleep. Queen Rin looks on from afar as she sees a structure known as the Tree of the Beginning emit a green light, which leaves both armies in awe and eventually leads to peace across the land. This scene then transitions into present day where it's revealed that this legend is celebrated by the local townsfolk in the very same castle from the story. Part of this celebration involves a tournament to crown this year's Guardian of the Aura, and as you've probably guessed, Ash is there to compete, once he and his friends get into some traditional outfits of course. Team Rocket dress up too as they're up to their usual antics, which is to be expected at this point. We then see the tournament play out as we're blessed by the greatest theme song in the history of the Pokemon anime, Unbeatable. Yeah, you guys can take your original theme and shove it for all I care. This is and always will be my favourite theme song. This is a full version of a theme song that was used for the advanced battle season of the anime, and I'm definitely not complaining because this theme is already perfect. I think the main thing I love about this song is the fact it's really energetic while still maintaining a laid back feel. The rhythm section is surprisingly understated being mixed very low, but it just works tremendously well. The drums have just the right amount of attack as to not distract from the light and airy chords that help carry this song. These softer elements are then cut through whenever the lead guitar pops up with its aggressive yet clean sounding tone, providing that energy that I was talking about earlier. It all just comes together so well, it creates a near perfect song, I just, oh, oh my god it's so good. Anyway, Ash eventually wins a tournament and as he's celebrating the runner up, a woman called Kid, introduces herself to him before they all go inside for Ash's ceremony. Ash is presented with Sir Aaron's scepter which begins to flash faintly as he grabs it. He then hears a voice ask him why. He's confused as to where it's coming from but shrugs it off. Everyone begins to dance and celebrate including Pikachu and his new friend Apom who I'm sure you can guess is just Mew in disguise. Ash and May decide to let out all of their Pokemon to play, however Ash himself is forced to stay on the throne as part of the festivities. The posse of Pokemon then venture off to play, with Meow falling closely behind, however he takes a tumble and ends up in the fireplace. Kid then walks into the room not noticing Meowth. 
She talks to someone over a headset she's wearing, mentioning that she's after Mew, before changing her clothes and hopping out of a nearby window. Meowth decides to follow but fails, falling through the window of the attic where all of the other Pokemon are playing. This alerts Kid, who notices Mew and sends her to Weavile to place a tracker on it. This leads to some commotion among the Pokemon, most of which end up being frozen, including Munchlax who Max followed up to the attic. As the pair of Weavile get ready to deliver a devastating attack to Pikachu, Meowth and Mew, the mythical Pokemon uses Teleport, taking the three of them to the Tree of Beginning, Mew's place of residence so to speak. We cut back to Ash who is asked to assume the pose of the hero. As he does, Aaron Scepter flashes, as Lucario reawakens and asks Ash why he abandoned him, mistaking him for his master due to Ash having a similar aura. Lucario then opens his eyes, realising Ash is a different person. He then flees and explores the castle, looking for answers as to why everything is so… different. The current queen, Eileen, having followed him, tells him that he's been asleep for centuries, which understandably throws him through a loop. A little later, Lucario explains what happened during the battle, and is shocked to learn that the people of the town believe Aaron to be a hero who put an end to the fighting. He assures the group that Aaron is a traitor, and just as he says this, Max comes bursting through the door to tell everyone what he saw. Kid then appears and corroborates his story. The Queen and her assistant subsequently inform the group that Mew rests in the Tree of Beginning, and that is where Ash will find his missing Pikachu. Lucario agrees to accompany the group on their expedition at the behest of the Queen, with Kid volunteering to join them also. Later that night, we see a brief interaction between Lucario and Ash. The Aura Pokemon asks our hero if he's Pikachu's master, to which Ash responds that he is his friend. Lucario then mentions that he doesn't have any friends, nor does he want any. In response, Ash scoffs, finding his attitude to be quite negative. The next day, we see the gang driving to the next destination, with Team Rocket hitching a free ride as always, and Furry Bit over here, leading the way on foot. Along the way, we're also treated to short scenes of Pikachu, Meowth and Mew, all playing together, which is pretty cute. Eventually, our heroes are stopped in their tracks by some geysers, so they decide to take a pit stop and enjoy a hot spring that's close by. While taking a dip, May discovers a strange flower. The group discovers that this is a time flower, a flower which can show visions of the past when responding to a strong aura like that of Sir Aaron or, in this case, Ash. That night, we see Ash recounting some fond memories he has of his time with Pikachu, which triggers some similar memories for Lucario in respect to his master. He rejects his memories, however, still feeling that Aaron is a traitor. He then goes on to say that Ash would turn his back on Pikachu like Aaron did him, which leads to an argument devolving into the two of them wrestling each other. Regardless, they continue their travels, eventually arriving at the site where Lucario was supposedly abandoned. The Pokemon's strong aura triggers a nearby time flower, leading to a flashback of the tragic event, which casts doubt over the validity of the legend told to Ash and his friends at the castle. Ash apologises to Lucario for his harsh words earlier, and the two of them make up, but then out of nowhere, a Regirock appears and begins attacking everyone. They manage to escape and find their way into the tree, and begin to admire the the beauty of its self-contained ecosystem, as Kid sends off some probes to take samples of the area to help her better understand how it all works. This alerts a nearby Registeel, as well as the tree's immune system, so to speak, which starts rapidly taking out the drones. As this is going on, we see Ash call out to Pikachu, who responds. However, before Ash can figure out where he is, a Regiice pops up and attacks, forcing the entire group to retreat. They end up running into Team Rocket, who are being chased by Regirock and Registeel. They all manage to escape, but not for long, as Jesse and James are both consumed by the tree's weird, gelatinous blood cells. Ash and friends press on, but slowly but surely, each of them are consumed, till only Ash, Kid and Lucario are left. Lucario being completely safe, because the tree doesn't deem Pokemon as a threat to itself. After a while, Ash and Pikachu are finally reunited, but they don't have room to celebrate, as they know they're still in danger. Despite their best efforts, they're cornered by the Regis, as well as the Red Blobs, which swallow Kid and Ash, which greatly upsets their respective Pokemon. So much so that Mew decides to use its powers to bring everyone back. Unfortunately, this takes a lot out of Mew and causes it to fall sick, in turn causing the Tree of Beginning to start to crumble and go into shock. This is due to Mew and the tree being symbiotic creatures, creatures which depend on one another for survival. Luckily, before the entire tree can be destroyed, Mew musters up enough energy to guide Ash, Kid and Lucario to a special room. It is here where Lucario finds Sir Aaron in a suspended state, and it is revealed through a Time Flower flashback 
that he's in this state due to his heroic act of offering his aura to Mew to save the kingdom. Lucario, finally accepting the truth, decides to follow in his master's footsteps and offers his aura to Mew to save the tree from dying. He struggles initially, but manages to get the ball rolling thanks to Ash offering some of his own aura to help out but eventually Lucario pushes Ash away to save him from meeting the same fate as Aaron. The Aura Guardian succeeds at saving the tree, as you see it glow a vibrant shade of green, but unfortunately, this takes a lot out of Lucario, but he doesn't seem to mind, as he takes a seat next to his master. This triggers one last time for our flashback, where we see Aaron's emotional farewell to his comrade. Now at peace, Lucario says goodbye to Ash, as he and his master's bodies turn into balls of energy which further fuel the tree. And with that, the credits roll. I know it may seem like I've rushed through the summary a bit, but honestly that was on purpose, because I wanted to illustrate what it's like to watch this movie for those who haven't seen it. While a fine watch as far as Pokemon movies go, Lucario and the Mystery of Mew suffers from the same primary issue as Pokemon 2000. Poor pacing. Much like in 2000, the writers did a fairly competent job of writing a build up, but again, much like in 2000, it starts to feel rushed once we pass the halfway mark. Stuff just seemed to happen in this movie, which gave it a very odd feel, and while it was better than 2000 in a lot of respects, it still had that weird flow to it, which stopped me from getting into it as much as I thought I would. By the time they reach the tree, it feels like this movie is going at a breakneck pace, while somehow still feeling like a slog. There's no better way I can articulate this experience. A lot of stuff falls flat, and it's not for a lack of trying. It's obvious they put some effort in, I mean, take Lucario's character arc for example. It's obvious they wanted us to feel sympathetic for this character, and see some sort of value in him. But, everything just happened so fast, it almost feels like we don't even get to know him. He's somewhat interesting, but there's just something missing from his character, and it detracts from the movie with him being a focal point and all. He isn't in league with more sympathetic characters like Mewtwo or Tori. Let's just say that. And the less said about Kid, the better. She's just there as a vehicle to move the story along, but pretty much ends up being as inconsequential as Team Rocket are in most of these movies. Now, moving on from that mess to the final movie of the advanced generation, Pokemon Ranger and the Temple of the Sea. The movie greets us with a nice opening shot of a mysterious egg floating through the ocean, passing by many water Pokemon on the way. This tranquil scene ends abruptly however, as we see a strange ship pursue this egg. As it turns out, the ship is piloted by Captain Phantom, and he's very aptly named Phantom Troops. The captain is very pleased with his loot, but before he gets a chance to take a closer look at it, one of his troops swipes the egg and takes off with it. We quickly learn that this troop is actually a Pokemon Ranger working undercover named Jack Walker. We also learn that he's more than qualified for the job, as we see him use his quick reflexes and wit to outrun the Phantom troops, even managing to escape when cornered. Shortly after this scene, we're greeted by our heroes, trudging through a desert, dehydrated and with no real sense of where they are. All of a sudden they see a giant bubble which grabs their attention, and as they get closer they realise it's coming from a group of water Pokemon, which are hanging out with a girl who introduces herself to the group as Lizabeth. Turns out Brock knows of her, she's part of a famous group of performers, the other members of which being members of a family, who invite Ash and friends to come see them perform. Q opening credits. Once again, an original instrumental is used for the credits. The track itself is nothing to write home about. It sounds pretty stock in all honesty. But what I will praise it for is for saving us from a full version of the Battle Frontier theme, or God forbid a remix of some kind. That theme song is dreadful in a way I can't even wrap my head around. Even as a kid I hated it. I'd argue it takes the number one spot for being the worst Pokemon theme of all time. The tune just kind of climbs constantly, but with no real musical momentum since it just sounds so flat and almost plastic. I could probably go into further detail, but this abomination isn't worth the time or breath, 
Go listen to it if you feel like making your ears bleed. Anyway, after the performance, we see a Buizel belonging to Elizabeth's family messing around with some kind of container, almost dropping it. May manages to catch it and accidentally presses a button on it, revealing it to contain the egg from earlier. The container is immediately taken from her by one of the performer clowns, who gives it to Elizabeth, who stores it somewhere secret. At the same time, Team Rocket, who are watching all of this unfold, decide to ring Phantom to clue him in on the whereabouts of the egg believing it will lead to them being rewarded handsomely. Later that night, Buizel starts fiddling with the container again, this time pressing the button, which causes the egg to emit a strange glow, which makes May, who's sleeping close by, have a very strange dream of her swimming through the ocean near the titular Temple of the Sea, running into a Pokemon that she's never seen before. May becomes enamoured with the Pokemon, to the point where when it leaves to go to the Temple of the Sea, she wakes up yelling, Don't go, despite barely knowing the thing. Seems like a fairly normal reaction to me. While sitting down to have a late breakfast with the gang, May tells everyone about the dream she had. Elizabeth and her mum then mention how they've had the same dream before and believe it to be linked with some kind of legend which is also linked to the heritage's water people or some shit. They theorise May could be a descendant too, which would explain the dream, but... As you can imagine, this doesn't go anywhere. While this is all going on, Team Rocket sneak into the trailers to steal the egg, but in the process, their bodies are swapped. Despite this, they try their best to get away with stealing the treasure, but they're stopped by the clown from earlier, who is revealed to be Jack Walker. He explains to the group that his mission is to make sure the egg, which contains a mythical Pokemon called Manaphy, hatches properly and finds its way to the Temple of the Sea. As Jackie is explaining this, the Phantom and his crew, flying on helicopters, and chase a gang around, trying to make up for Team Rocket's failure. During the commotion, May ends up with the egg and the Manaphy hatching in her arms. Luckily, she manages to get away along with everyone else in the Marina Group's trailers, but the captain and his troops won't give up that easily, as they continue to give chase until they're led into some ruins which they struggle to navigate, deciding to wait for our heroes on the other side. Meanwhile, Ash and Cole looking at a giant mural in the ruins, depicting the Legend of the Sea Temple and the People of the Water, as they get an explanation as to what the legend is, as well as how Manaphy fits into it all. Liz's family also mention an ancient treasure found in the temple, known as the Sea Crown, which seems to be what Phantom wanted Manaphy for, as the legendary would have the ability to lead the pirate to the temple. On their way out of the ruins, Jack informs Ash and his friends that their time together has come to an end, as he can no longer involve the group on his mission of taking Manaphy to the Temple of the Sea. The group later arrives at a port town, where the Marina group and Jackie part ways with our heroes. Of course, this doesn't go to plan as Manaphy begins to cry as soon as the ship sets sail, using its powers to swap Jackie and Ash's bodies. Walker then yields and decides to let the gang tag along for a little while longer. Then, in true Pokemon movie tradition, we get a string of scenes showing May and her new friend bonding. Although this time, these montages serve more of a purpose than just being filler, as it shows Jackie's growing disapproval of the relationship with every subsequent scene. Said disapproval obviously doesn't come from any kind of malice, but rather concern for Manaphy, as if it gets too close to May, it won't want to leave her side and live the life it should. I guess there's no better time to talk about it, so fuck it, let's address the elephant in the room. May's maternal arc. Throughout the movie, May and Manaphy's relationship becomes more and more reflective of a relationship between a mother and a child. A child the mother essentially has to set free before she deems them ready for that step. This is probably the most controversial part of this movie, I don't really partake in any Pokemon anime discourse online, but over the years I've heard plenty of people reference this aspect of the movie, usually with disdain. And understandably so, it's quite odd to witness someone who's 10 or 11 years old go through the stages of grief one would experience when losing a child. Add on to that the fact that said child can be incredibly annoying with its constant crying, and you've got a very divisive plot point to say the least. I personally didn't mind it too much because I've got a tolerance for weird shit like this as long as it's not too invasive or too distracting. And in this case, I think it's okay for something that's the focal point of the whole film. If anything, I've got to applaud it in a way. At the cost of spoiling my verdict for the film, while I couldn't get into it as much as I wanted, I've got to give Temple of the Sea its flowers because it achieves something a lot of the movies thus far have failed to. And that's creating an identity all of its own. For better or for worse, once you watch this movie, 
you're going to remember something about it after the fact. And that's more than I can say for pretty much all of these movies, even the good ones. Staying on topic, we'll later see the next part of May's arc unfold, as she overhears Jackie telling Ash to separate her and a new friend. She makes her presence known and lets Jackie know that she'll be fine when they're separated, but the ranger scolds May, asking her to think of Manaphy, to realise that if she keeps getting close to Manaphy, she'll be tampering with nature. This upsets May, who runs off crying. Elizabeth, who is passing by, decides to follow her so she can go console her. The next day, we see Manaphy looking around for May, to distract it, Ash sends out all of his Pokemon, so the Prince of the Sea has someone to play with. May, who is watching her friend from a distance, loses a bandana to a strong gust of wind. Manaphy, not noticing May in the distance, recognises the bandana and decides to retrieve it. However, a passing Sharpedo gets it caught on its fin, but doesn't seem to notice as it makes its descent to the bottom of the ocean, with Manaphy trying its best to keep up. Eventually, everyone notices that Manaphy's been gone for a while, so they decide to take a submarine to go look for it. It doesn't take them long to find him, but they're presented with a new problem, as both they and Manaphy are whisked away in a riptide, losing complete control of the vessel. Thankfully, the Prince of the Sea manages to lead them out of the riptide, and subsequently into the Temple of the Sea. Unbeknownst to our heroes, the Phantom is still on their tail and follows them into the temple. Jack, who is still on the ship, notices this and decides to give chase to ensure the safety of our heroes. Manaphy leads a group into a room with a stone tablet, which none of them can read, when all of a sudden Phantom pops up. He somehow has the ability to read the moon runes and manages to solve the puzzle, gaining access to the treasure room holding the sea crown. Everyone follows him in and does nothing to try and stop him as he pries one of the crystals out of the sea crown. This causes a temple to become unstable and start to flood, forcing the gang to evacuate as the captain stays there grabbing as much loot as he can. Before he can clear the whole place out, Jackie pops up and manages to snatch some of the crystals and put them back where they belong. Unfortunately, he gets a little overconfident and during a tussle with Phantom over one of the crystals, both he and the pirate fall into the water below, eventually being forced to give up and evacuate. Back at the entrance of the temple, we see Manaphy, feeling a sense of duty to save the temple. He decides to jump out of May's arms and take action, with both May and Ash in tow. They eventually get back into the room housing the Sea Crown, managing to get all of the crystals back in the rightful place. All except one. After initially trying to evacuate once more, they find the final crystal thanks to Pikachu. And following what is admittedly a pretty epic scene, Ash manages to place the final crystal back in the crown, restoring the crumbling temple. The day isn't saved just yet though, as Captain Phantom makes a last ditch effort to catch Manaphy, but with the help of the water Pokemon and powers he gained from saving the temple, don't ask, Ash manages to save the mythical Pokemon. Now that both the temple and Manaphy are safe, May says a tearful goodbyes to her friend slash child, and with that, the credits roll. When I originally watched this movie, I wasn't the biggest fan, but upon rewatching it, I realised I liked it a lot more than I initially thought. But it wasn't for the reasons I initially thought. You see, I've seen and enjoyed this particular story elsewhere. Where, you may ask? Well, the Mystery Dungeon Explorer games. I'm not going to spoil anything, but I think that story was much stronger despite being a small subsection of a much larger game. But that's not to take away from what this movie did. It did a fine job at what it set out to do, despite minor missteps like the occasional bit of disjointed dialogue and Manaphy's annoying crying. The fact this movie managed to pull off something as odd as making me a mother alone is impressive and worth some admiration. And outside of that, there's some other stuff that I really appreciated, like the fact they gave Jackie an actual backstory and motivation for being part of the movie, unlike what's her face from the last movie. But I've rambled about this movie long enough, so I'll leave you with this. I can't guarantee you'll like this movie because of its weird premise, but of all the movies so far, it's probably the one with the most personality and that's got to count for something. So, that's the advanced generation. In some ways, I think it was better than the original, and in others, I think it was worse. We're now nine movies deep, and one of my main takeaways is that these movies suffer greatly due to their choppy animation. I don't know if this is just what anime looked like at the time, or if it was a product of a budgeting thing, but a lot of the post-2000 movies have this feel of being made for TV. 
and I think most of them were, at least outside of Japan. But make no mistake, it's not that big a deal and it's not that noticeable if you're just watching the movies casually. It's just something I started to notice more around the start of the Gen 3 movies, so I thought I should mention it. Although on a more positive note, I think some of the writing and general pacing was a lot better than the series previous. Perhaps the anime was developing a little more at the time, or maybe it's just a coincidence, but either way, these movies tended to go down a lot smoother than the previous did. That being said, I think I can say with confidence that I have no desire to revisit any of these flicks, maybe other than Destiny Deoxys, because honestly I feel like I, I wouldn't miss them if I never watched them again. Yes, even Temple of the Sea, despite the praise, I just gave it. Granted, I'm the same with movies 1 to 5. I only really have a desire to revisit Mewtwo Strikes Back, and that's most likely a nostalgia thing. I think the main downfall of these movies is the fact that they're inconsequential. While watching these movies, I've sat and thought, would I enjoy these more if I was watching the anime alongside them? And the conclusion I've come to is... No. These movies have no bearing on the canon of the actual show. Sure, you might get the occasional episode that references events that happened in a past movie, but oftentimes it's like these events never happened, so it's hard to get invested in said events. Another downfall of these movies has to be the limitations of the anime itself. I touched on this in the Deoxys portion, but for some reason the Pokemon anime has a limit to how serious and mature it can get. Granted, this is me with my limited knowledge of the anime talking. For all I know, as soon as Gen 6 rolls around, the plots could get as serious as Metal Gear Solid. But largely from the episodes of the anime that I've seen and the movies that I've watched, Pokemon doesn't do much to fight off its made for children, watched by children image. I get a little more enjoyment out of watching this shit than Blue's Clues, but that's probably because of a pre-existing love of the source material. Okay, maybe I'm being a little harsh, but the limitations put on the Pokemon anime really affects the quality of these movies, so I just hope we see some kind of evolution going into Gen 4. Now we're getting back into familiar territory. When it comes to the Sinnoh movies, I've watched each of them twice at the very least, Probably more, since it was shown here in the UK on CITV, regularly between airings of Gen 4 episodes. And this first movie in particular, I remember being my absolute favourite for a time, but it's been so long since I watched it, so let's see if I still enjoy it all these years later. We start off with yet another lazy, this is a world of Pokemon speech, this time leading us into a fight between the legendary Pokemon Dialga and Palkia. Sandwiched between two of these fight scenes is a shot of a gentleman named Tonio, who just happens to be reading a book on space and time, when a large tremor hits, causing him to fall off his chair. We then see Ash, Don and Brock travelling to Alamo's town for a contest, but turns out they're on the wrong shore and are unable to make it. Luckily, a girl called Alice comes down in a hot air balloon and helps the gang out, and then takes them on a tour of the city to see the sights. This leads us into our opening credits, which uses a Battle Dimension theme song instead of the Diamond and Pearl one. I think it's probably for the best, because the corny rapping of the original Diamond and Pearl theme probably wouldn't have worked as well. The Battle Dimension theme is a lot more inspirational, making it a great fit for a movie, especially this version of the song. This remix is quite faithful to the original with a similar uplifting vibe, just with a male singer instead of a female singer, although there is a slightly more acoustic -y sound to it, which is a welcome change, however negligible it may be. Anyway, one of the sights Alice takes our heroes to is this cute little garden of sorts. Everyone lets her Pokemon out to play and enjoy the scenery and cartoony hijinks ensue, including a little scuffle between Dawn's Piplup and a Shinx that lives in the town. This eventually escalates to a standoff between the main group of Pokemon and the locals. Thankfully, just like Melody before her, Alice knows how to play Mask Off, and manages to calm all of the critters down. Just as everything settles down, a Gallade pops up and draws everyone's attention to some warped and mangled pillars. Before they can even begin to guess what caused it, they're greeted by the pompous and arrogant Baron Alberto, who believes Darkrai is to blame. As he's explaining this, he notices some rustling in a nearby bush, and sends out his Licky Licky to use Hyper Beam on it. Turns out the rustling was Tonio doing some research on the recent shockwaves felt throughout the town. During this scene, we get a glimpse at a love triangle between our trio of side characters. Alberto reveals his feelings for Alice, however, they're not reciprocated, 
and she says she likes Tonya, who obviously feels the same, but struggles to say it. As this is going on, we see the source of the earthquakes, Dialga and Palkia fighting. The group is hit by yet another shockwave. This time, it alerts Darkrai, who screams at everyone to leave. The Baron tries to attack the pitch black Pokemon, but fails, as it retaliates with a dark void attack, which ends up hitting Ash, leading to our protagonist having an intense nightmare. Thankfully, he's eventually woken by Pikachu's Thunderbolt after being transported to the Pokemon Center. Later that night, we see Tony looking through his grandfather Gordy's diary, where he finds a picture of him with Alice's young grandmother, Alicia. We're then treated to a brief flashback as he reads the story of how Alicia met an injured Darkrai and befriended it. The next day, Tony is visited by Ash and friends. As they're conversing, Pikachu and the other Pokemon happen upon some music discs, which pique the interest of Ash and Dawn. Tony then takes him to the tower, which can play said discs for the whole town to hear. After this, everyone goes about their own business, while in the other dimension, two thirds of the creation trio continue to duke it out. This fighting leads to yet another shockwave of sorts, which causes a Palkia coloured light to appear in the sky, which draws the attention of the townsfolk. This once again alerts Darkrai, who screams, go away. Ash tries to battle him before Alberto butts in and tries to fight him himself, only to fail. The mythical Pokemon then fires off Dark Void attacks, putting most of the Pokemon in the plaza to sleep. This attack is followed by a bunch of strange occurrences, like floating Pokemon, the Baron being turned into a Licky Licky, and the entire town being surrounded by a thick fog that stops people from leaving. And before you ask, yes, someone does try to use Defog, and it does about as much as it does in the Gen 4 games. Fuck all. Baron Alberto gets annoyed and begins to rally the townsfolk, asking them to join him in hunting down Darkrai, as he feels that he's to blame for all of this. However, Alice feels differently, as does Tonio, who tells Alice that she was saved from falling to her death as a child, thanks to Darkrai, and not himself as she previously thought. He also goes on to explain that this disturbance was caused by something from another dimension, that being Palkia, as he later learns looking through some footage caught by his Drifblim. The townspeople find Darkrai and begin to attack it to no avail, as the legendary is too strong. Eventually, Palkia appears and joins the fray, as does Dialga after some time, attacking both of them. Darkrai tries its best to stop the duo from fighting, but it begins to seem futile as the entire town is sucked into a different dimension and slowly starts to disappear. Luckily, Tony remembers reading something about a song that can calm any Pokemon in Godi's diary. The group then race against the clock, scrambling desperately to try and save the town, and they succeed and convince an now relaxed Palkia to restore the town. However, during the fight, Darkrai absorbed what would have been a catastrophic collision between the rulers of time and space and this ends up costing him his life. But this is a Pokemon movie, so he comes back to life somehow and everyone goes home happy. I've got to say, it's kind of a shame the movie ended this way. It kind of goes back to what we were saying before about the anime being too soft for its own good. If they just let Darkrai stay dead, it would have been fine. It wouldn't have affected the canon, and it would have made the movie that much better, giving it a more somber ending. Especially since the last half hour or so felt so dire and action packed, which was the last thing I was expecting going into this. Okay, maybe it was a little bit because I do remember enjoying the action sequences as a kid, but I was a kid. I probably found pissing standing up to be intense, never mind a fight between deities. But surprisingly, the action was just as good as I remember it, and is probably the best example of action in a Pokemon movie thus far. It's made that much sweeter by the fact the movie wastes very little time getting into it. There's very little fluff in this movie. Everything that happens, happens for a reason and aids in the plot's progression. And that's the best I can ask for in these movies because it makes the simplistic stories work a lot better on top of helping them feel a lot grander. Also, I can't remember if any other movie does this past the This Is The World Of Pokemon intro sequence, but I really liked how this movie used the Gen 4 game soundtracks. Incorporating those familiar songs and melodies was a phenomenal choice, especially since a lot of the scores so far have been pretty forgettable. As are some of the settings to these movies, but Alamos Town in particular has always stood out to me as an interesting one, but I couldn't tell you why, because it's not too dissimilar to the others. That's all I've really got to say about this movie, it's a great watch, probably my top 5 so far. 
Now, let's see if movie 11 can match it. Our next movie is Giratina and the Sky Warrior, and introduces us to both titular characters immediately, as we see the Sky Warrior Shaman approaching a lake to take a quick drink. All of a sudden, the God of Time shows up to take a drink also, but then, out of nowhere, Satan himself, Giratina, pops up and decides to drag Dialga to hell. Shaman, who was watching on from a few feet away, gets sucked into the distortion world while gripping Dialga's tail for dear life. All the while, we have some menacing character called Zero watching on. Dialga tries desperately to escape Giratina's clutches a few times, but keeps getting dragged back into what the characters in this movie refer to as the Reverse World. During one of these attempts, Shaman gets sent flying onto a platform and manages to land safely, but is consumed by some purple mist which it sucks up, before being propelled into the air once more by a stray attack from Giratina. While in the air, it locks eyes with the Renegade Pokemon and ends up using Seed Flare out of fear, which rips open a portal, transporting it to the Reverse World. Shortly after this, Dialga manages to make an escape also, by trapping its opponent in a time loop. We then cut to our heroes, who are getting ready to eat a nice meal, but decide to let their Pokemon out to eat first. While they're distracted, a dirt-covered shaman pops up and starts snacking on the human's food. This leads to a bit of a confrontation, but Dawn de-escalates the situation, and subsequently gives shaman a little wash. The gratitude Pokemon living up to its name, in some sense at least, uses its telepathy to thank Dawn, which catches everyone off guard. After chatting with the Pokemon a bit, Brock notices something's off about Shaman, and realises it's not feeling well, deciding to take it to a Pokemon Center. Once it's been treated, the party learn a little bit more about Shaman and its abilities, and it's during this time we learn that Shaman is a sassy little cunt, as it demands Ash and friends take it to the Flower Garden. They barely make it a few feet from the Pokemon Center before Shaman is swiped from them by Team Rocket, but it doesn't end well for either party, as everyone with the exception of Brock is sucked into the distortion world. Ash and Dawn immediately encounter Giratina, and Shaman begins to freak out, believing it's going to be eaten by the beast. The group try to fight it off, but deal little damage. A man called Newton Graceland then pops up and leads them away from Giratina, and gives them the 411 on the weird dimension they found themselves in, as he leads them back home. They learn that Giratina is mad at Dialga and Palkia because their battle in the Rise of Darkrai affected time and space, causing anomalies which manifested in the distortion world as poisonous clouds. This is what led to Giratina attacking the God of Time, but now it's mad at Shaman for giving it the opportunity to escape with its Seed Flare attack. And just like the old expression, the devil pops up and begins attacking the group, but luckily they manage to leave through the portal just in time, with Newton staying behind to continue his research. Team Rocket then show up trying to leave also, but they're too late, so they decide to follow Newton around. Back in the real world, Ash and friends are confronted by Zero, who demands a hand over Shaman. They make a break for it and manage to escape on a train where they meet some friendly passengers, one of which is holding some Gracedia flowers, which causes Shaman to change into its sky form. Zero's Pokemon return with a vengeance and break through the train windows to try and kidnap Shaman, but Ever manages to fight them off and reach their next destination. While on a ship, the gang gets sucked back into the distortion world, but Shaman, now feeling confident in its stronger and faster form, decides to pick a fight with Giratina. Said confidence doesn't last long, however, as night falls, forcing the grass-covered hedgehog to return to its usual state. Everyone decides to make a break for it, and once again, Newton lends him a hand. But they're not safe for long, as Zero, who followed them in, captures everybody and forces Shaman to use its signature move once again, to rip a hole in the sky, allowing Giratina to escape. Zero then calls in his ship and uses a mechanism Newton built to capture Giratina and harness its power. Newton explains to the group that he created the machine so that he could enter and leave the reverse world at will for research purposes, but soon realised it would mean sacrificing the ruler of that world. He destroyed the blueprints, but Zero, who was once Newton's assistant, memorised them. Our heroes spring into action, as does Shaman, who's now back in its sky form. With some help from the gang, Newton manages to buy some time and break into Zero's ship, hacking and shutting down the whole system, which frees Giratina and sends a ship careening down into the woods below. Zero manages to use an escape pod, which is souped up with the powers he stole using the machine. He shoots out of the water and begins attacking Ashenko, before going into the reverse world to fuck with the real world. 
He causes an avalanche which awakens a sleeping Regigigas who, with the help of a herd of mammoth swine, manages to hold it off for a while, avoiding any serious damage. Eventually Sherman and Giratina manage to dispose of Zero, allowing the renegade Pokemon to return to its world and for Sherman to join its friends as they all fly off into the sunset and with that the credits roll. So that was our 11th movie and I've got to say it, it wasn't half bad. It did what it needed to do and that was not be boring, but beyond that it's a very average paint by numbers Pokemon movie. Nothing really all that special to me personally. Well, now that I think about it, Shaman was a pretty interesting character. Giving it a sassy attitude definitely made it stand out. And the callback to Rise of Darkrai was neat. It actually gave some semblance of weight to the events of that movie by having those events lead to the plot of this movie. Past that, I don't really have much to say about it. I definitely liked it less than the last one even if it carried over some of what made that one so good. Now let's see if Arcus and the Jewel of Life does any better. You'll never guess what this movie's intro is. Yes, it's another this is a world of Pokemon speech. This time it transitions into another callback to Rise of Darkrai, which gives us a trilogy of sorts, which brings up some questions about the canon, which I've already kind of touched on, but we'll talk more about in our next intermission. Anyway, this callback then transitions into a scene of a dormant Arceus having a flashback to the time he was betrayed by a man named Darmos, who he lent the Jewel of Life to. We then see our heroes who are taking a little dip in a nearby lake when some watermelons come bobbing towards them. Turns out they belong to a pair of kids who our heroes end up battling as part of our opening credits scene. You probably noticed I didn't mention anything about an opening track in the last movie, and that's because there wasn't one, and the one I expected to be used was saved for this movie. That being Battle Cry, aka Stand Up, or the Galactic Battle theme song if you'd like. This is just a full version of the TV theme song, which I don't mind since I've always been quite fond of this song. My only real criticism of it now as an adult with a more refined taste in music is that it sounds a little too similar to the last theme. It carries a similar uplifting vibe which is certainly a welcome change from the typical high energy tunes the series tends to go for, but being used immediately after a similar sounding track kinda detracts from its qualities, which there are plenty of. I kind of flip flop on if I prefer this one or We Will Be Heroes, but both utilise synths and backing vocals incredibly well. A small gripe I have with Stand Up is the weird bridge that kind of feels like it's crowbarred into the song, but shit, I'd take hearing that bridge over the Sino League Victors theme song any day of the week. Speaking of which, that theme isn't used for the next movie. Thank God. Musical opinions aside, once a battle is all wrapped up, Ash and Co go to check out some ruins that their opponents told them about. While there, the gang almost gets sucked up in some kind of vortex, before a girl called Sheena and a friend Kevin show up and summon Dialga to save them. This alerts Giratina who pops up and begins to attack the God of Time just like last time. Thankfully, Ash manages to get through to the beast and calm it down. As it leaves, another vortex pops up and traps Dialga, when all of a sudden Palkia pops up to save it, now having settled things with its counterpart. After the pair take their leave, Sheena and Kevin take our heroes to a special room inside the ruins. The pair explain how they know about the events involving the creation trio. They then go on to explain who Arceus is to the group, and that the god is seeking vengeance on humanity for the betrayal at the hands of Damos. They then present the Jewel of Life to the gang, and explain how they must return it to Arceus once it awakens. And like clockwork, their time-space axis goes off, indicating the arrival of the Alpha Pokemon, who begins destroying the area surrounding the ruins. Sheena tries to offer the Jewel of Life to Arceus, but it turns out to be a fake, which enrages a deity even more. The creation trio then show up and try to fight off Arceus, only further fueling its anger. During the battle, Dialga sends everyone but Kevin back in time to stop Damos from causing this issue to begin with. The group isn't sent far back enough initially, as they get to see the story unfold right before their eyes, seeing Arceus lay ruin to his traitor's domain. Before they get taken out as well, Sheena asks Dialga to send them further back in time before the events unfolded. Upon arrival, everyone except for her is arrested by Deimos' apprentice, Marcus, while he asks her about the future. Pikachu and Piplup manage to escape captivity with the help of a Pichu, while Ash and friends share a cell with Damos. 
And surprise, surprise, Marcus is the real villain, as to discover Damos' intentions appear, and that he was hypnotised during the supposed betrayal, just like they were before being imprisoned. And thankfully, they all worked together and managed to stop the real culprit at the end, minus some close calls like Arceus nearly dying. And that's that. I'm gonna go on record and say, this trilogy gets worse as it goes on. You can make a case for this movie being better than Sky Warrior or vice versa, but both are objectively worse than Rise of Darkrai. But you know what? I was pleasantly surprised by the quality of all three. I initially thought it was nostalgia or something, but to be completely honest, despite having seen these movies a lot as a kid, I only had some spotty memories of Rise of Darkrai and pretty much nothing of the other two. I remember actively avoiding rewatches unless there was nothing else on TV. But having rewatched it now all these years later, I think it's fine. It's it's an average movie, pretty much on par with the last in terms of quality. I do have some nitpicks however. Arcus's voice for one. I'm not sure what it is, but Arcus's voice reminds me of Mark Hamill's Joker. In other words, it's not fitting of a god. I'll give it points for originality because it sounds nothing like the other Pokemon using telepathy like Mewtwo or Lugia, but it still sounds off. But I can kind of ignore it because it's not a constant thing, only really being highlighted when Arcus is yelling. Another small nitpick I have is that the opening section felt kind of clumsy. The appearance of the creation trio felt so hand-fisted, like they were all just shoved in one after another to let the viewer know that they were going to be in the movie. Thankfully the rest of the movie is pretty consistent and does a decent job at building a steady narrative and keeping the viewer engaged. Now for a final movie of the Diamond and Pearl era, Zoroark and the Master of Illusions. This movie opens with a gang watching a sport called Pokemon Backer on TV, expressing interest in going to see it in a live setting. The program then cuts to a segment hyping up a popular team called the Nimbasa Legends, which is comprised of all three legendary beasts and is led by a man named Grings Kodai, which is a pretty unique name. And would you look at that, this man is actually a villain. Who would have guessed? Kodai is keeping a Zoroark as well as her offspring Zoroark captive and forcing them to use their special illusion abilities for... evil stuff I'm guessing? We get to see Zoroark's power with her own eyes, before it's separated from its pup, who also uses its skills to escape the clutches of its captors. Due to its mischievous nature, Zoro ends up getting into trouble with a bunch of Vigoroth, which is when it encounters Ashenko, who save it from a beating. The pup then points a group in the direction of Crown City, where it hopes to find its Mima, aka Zoroark. Despite its absence, Kodai uses Zoro's influence on its mom to manipulate into terrorising the city while transforming into the legendary beasts. Before she begins a rampage, however, we see a moment of peace in the city, as Celebi frolics around the city bringing joy to all the people and Pokemon. Then, chaos ensues, as Zoroark's rampage is underway, all the while being recorded by a captor. While she's still wreaking havoc, Kodai takes what footage he has, manipulates it, and paints the narrative that Zoroark has actually taken control of the trio, and is attacking the city of its own free will. Everyone is forced to evacuate by the local officer Jenny, who informs our heroes, who have just arrived in the city, about what's going on. The party's attention is drawn to a nearby monitor broadcasting the attacks. Zoroark immediately recognises its Mima and informs the group that Kodai is a real menace. A journalist called Carl, who is listening in on the conversation, becomes intrigued by the whole ordeal and decides to help. Meanwhile, Grings is on his ship, spying on the Celebi from earlier, who he believes is his ticket to having control over something called the Time Ripple. He then begins to have some sort of vision showing a future where Ash and friends try to stop his plans. We then see said group sneak into the city through the sewers, where they discover the damage done to the city was all just an illusion. Zoroa then picks up on his mum's scent and decides to track her down, not realising Kodai has recaptured her. Speaking of which, Kodai is now exploring the city trying to find the Time Ripple himself, as he's paranoid about the vision he saw earlier. Eventually a tiny fox ends up running into Pokemon belonging to a pair called Joe and Tammy, the former of which is Carl's grandfather. They take the group in for a while and sedate Zoroa to calm it down, but it doesn't last long, as it wakes up and ends up freaking out. It makes its way outside and ends up in a confrontation with a bunch of wild Pokemon, with Piplup and Pikachu backing him up. This situation is diffused by Celebi, who befriends Zoroa before the four of them run off to find Zoroark. Ash and the rest try to join them, but end up being captured by the evil Psychic and taken to the airship. They're quickly freed by Rowena, 
a journalist who is posing as Kodai's assistant, who tells the crew about his plans to use a time ripple to rejuvenate his powers. Powers he gained 20 years ago by the same means, which sapped the life out of the city's beautiful foliage. Kodai ends up locating Celebi and attempts to strangle visions out of it so he can find the time ripple. He manages to get some short visions before Celebi is saved by the efforts of Ashenko. Through all of these events, Zoroark has desperately been trying to escape its prison, hearing the calls of its young, despite the distance between them. Now finally having broken out of its cage, it breaks through the ship and is met by a new hurdle, the real legendary beasts, who are the city's guardians. They were alerted during the fake attacks and are still under the impression that the Master of Illusion is a threat. Regardless, she tries her best to fight her way to a pup, while our heroes try and figure out where the time ripple is so they can get Celebi through there before Grings finds it. They then realise he's been listening in on the conversation this whole time and decide to split up, with one team saving Zoroark and the other getting Celebi to its destination. And they succeed despite Kodai's best efforts. However, throughout this whole mad journey, Zoroark got badly injured and it looks like it's about to die. But of course, this is a Pokemon movie, so Celebi uses its powers to revive it, Kodai gets exposed for the maniacal arsehole he is, gets arrested, and the day is saved. In my honest opinion, the fake out death ending is probably one of the worst options it could have gone for for multiple reasons. Least of all being that at least six movies so far have used that trope. A heartfelt reunion would have been more than enough, especially considering how heart-wrenching the adventure had already been up until that point. Seeing the separation of a mother and a child, trying desperately to reunite, being faced with roadblock after roadblock, is an emotional roller coaster. Especially on Zoroark's end, she was basically abused through the whole movie and we're just forced to sit and watch. But I guess it helped Kodai become what I firmly believe is the best villain so far. He's genuinely formidable and smart and feels like a threat. He's very well written and actually made me feel hatred for him because his slivery arse almost always seemed to get one over on Zoroark. He's a very logical and grounded villain, which is a compliment I can extend to the writing of this movie too. For most Pokemon movies, a suspension of disbelief is required. It's the main reason why I haven't poked too much fun at the, at times, nonsensical plot points of these movies. You've kind of got to pretend you don't see the obvious solution the characters have at their disposal to pull enjoyment from the Pokemon anime. It's just how it is. But this movie, much like this Nidioxis, is very logical and grounded. It's realistic, at least when compared to its predecessors. I could try to break it down and explain it to you, but I feel like it would be better understood if you watched it yourself, because it is one of the better written movies. Forced, emotional ending notwithstanding. And for that, it makes my top three, up there with films one and seven. Now, how about a little intermission? It is getting pretty dark after all. We are now over halfway done with these movies. Thank God. And what a nice collection of movies to help us reach that milestone. I was very weary after the spotty original series of movies and the slightly more consistent yet still spotty advanced generation. But thankfully the Diamond and Pearl era was a lot more consistent, giving us some of our best movies so far. I think the main reason I preferred them was because they were a lot more concise with their storytelling. They got across what they needed to and kept the plots moving, rarely shoehorning in pointless dialogue and side plot to go nowhere. And that's a massive strength if you ask me. If the Pokemon anime isn't going to try to be something more, it can at least try and be the best version of itself it can be. And I think the Diamond and Pearl movies are exactly that. They're by no means perfect. Sky Warrior and the Jewel of Life in particular, I could ignore for the rest of time and not miss all too much. But the fact that I've got two new favourites gives me a lot of hope for the movies that are coming up that I've not seen yet, even if I know some of them will likely disappoint. Speaking of which... The Gen 5 anime. The era when I called it quits. I don't know if I just became too old to enjoy the show like I once did, or if it was an issue with the new characters, but I remember quitting halfway through Gen 5. It just bored me to tears and made me question if I was still a fan. I have long since found the answer to that question. Either way, I don't have much faith going into these movies, especially because I remember absolutely hating one of them, but hey, the Arceus movie won me over, so who knows, maybe things will change. Anyway, film 14 is split into two and the differences are pretty minor, so 
I'll just stick with black since it was the version of the game I picked as a kid. It begins with a scene of a man named Damon visiting a town in a tundra, where he talks about the revival of the Kingdom of the Vale with one of the townsfolk, before asking to see the village chief. We then cut to a scene of her and her son searching for some herbs, before a giant iceberg kinda just floats into the ice surrounding them, slowly destroying it bit by bit, till they're stranded, staring death in the face. Luckily, Damon swoops in with his pet fucking Zekrom and obliterates the iceberg. The chief is left in awe and decides to take Damon's request into consideration. We then see Ash, Silent and Iris travelling to some kind of tournament, when they find a pair of Deerlink who are about to fall off a cliff. Ash decides to help out but almost falls off too, before Victini, who's hiding nearby, gives him some of its powers, causing him to jump a great distance and land safely on the other side of the chasm. With some more help from Victini in the form of visions, he makes it through a cave and meets his friends on the other side. They cut through a castle known as the Sword of the Vale to get to their next destination, where they meet Damon, who escorts them there. All the while, Victini is fucking with Ash after taking a liking to him, no doubt from seeing his selfless actions earlier. Anyway, the tournament begins and we get to hear yet another inspirational and uplifting theme song. I'm just gonna rip the bandaid off right now and let you guys know I'm not a big fan of any of the Gen 5 themes. This one might be the best one, but that's not saying much. It's just kind of flat. The production doesn't pop like it did in the past, and as a song, it wears out its welcome very quickly. The version used here, I believe, is just the regular full version. I initially thought it was a different version due to what I heard as new instruments, but turns out my ears were playing tricks on me, it's most likely the same version. And I can definitively say that listening to this full version feels like trudging through Route 217. Anyway, the tournament continues and one of the contestants, a girl called Carlita, notices something strange when watching Ash battle. His Tepig randomly powers up and destroys its opponent, despite being beaten up pretty badly seconds earlier. She believes this is a work of Victini, as she knows a lot about the mythical Pokemon. And sure enough, her theory is proven to be true, as in a battle against Ash, she notices a victory Pokemon help his frail little Scraggy get the victory. She informs Ash about Victini's role, which leads to a Protag baiting out the rare Pokemon with some of Silent's macarons. This leads to a budding friendship between the two of them, as they explore the city together. However, they hit a brick wall, or should I say barrier, as when Ash tries to take Victini past one of the pillars surrounding the castle, Victini is bounced back due to the force field surrounding the castle. The legendary then flies away, scared and in pain. The group visit Carlita's mother Juanita to get some help finding Victini. During the search, they run into the mayor of the city, as well as Damon, who's apparently Carlita's brother. They end up finding the victory Pokemon after a while and hang out at the mayor's place, where he tells everybody about the legend of the people of the Vale. It's loosely based on the lore found in the Gen 5 games, the two brothers and all that malarkey. However, in this version of the story, there was no original dragon as far as I can tell, and the war waged between the two princes disrupted something called the Dragon Force. The Dragon Force is some kind of energy that kept the kingdom stable, which, once corrupted, started having the opposite effect. In his desperation, the king asked for Victini's help. This led to the creation of the Pillars of Protection, and the Sword of the Veil vale being moved away from the valley it once laid. The king then died from using up all of his energy to aid in Victini's efforts, while Victini was forced to stay in the castle, unable to escape due to the barrier that the Pillars created. Following the king's passing, the princes shamefully placed their respective dragons, who ended up turning into stones, deep in a cave somewhere. The same cave that Damon would find Zekrom in years later, using its powers to convince the people of the Vale, who now live scattered all around the world, to return and rebuild a kingdom with him. The next day, he sets out to do just that, as with the help of his Sigilith, he moves both the Sword of the Veil, as well as the Pillars, up into the air. Victini, who is hanging out with Ashenko, sees the Pillars flying towards it and is lured into the castle out of fear. Damon then captures Victini and begins using its powers to help him achieve his goal. Everyone tries to stop him from using Victini's powers, because if he continues, it will die and the Dragon Force will get out of control and destroy the world. However, it's futile, because with Zekrom on his side, he's near unstoppable. Thankfully, Juanita remembers that Reshiram exists and decides to take the gang to go look for it. After almost dying a couple times, Ash finds a white stone and resurrects Reshiram, and with its help, brings both Damon and Zekrom to their senses. Everyone then works together to put the castle back where it belongs and the day is saved. I'm not gonna mince words here, 
This is without a doubt the worst movie so far, and I am so glad I didn't sit for both versions. While I've dunked on movies like 2000 and Forever, possibly unfairly due to my personal lack of enjoyment with them, I'll always say that they do have something going for them. This movie on the other hand is not only boring, it's also dumb and an insult to the games it pulls its material from. Black and white while being complex and story heavy games were never lore heavy games. The writers of this movie forgot that and tried to pull what little lore they could find and build something off of it like they did with the Gen 4 movies. This leads to a boring retelling of the two brothers story from the Gen 5 games which serves as a vehicle for a nonsensical plot. A nonsensical plot with a nonsensical villain, whose entire motive for almost destroying the world and killing a Pokemon is wanting to move his city a couple hundred feet to the left. This movie feels like it's trying so hard to achieve what the Diamond and Pearl series did, but the thing about those movies is, they balance some decent stories with some decent fights. The couple of action scenes this movie does have last all of 5 seconds, and that would be fine if it gave way to a good story, but... It doesn't. The Gen 5 games achieve what they achieved due to having that leeway to be dark and edgy at times. The anime on the other hand has rarely, if ever, had that reputation or type of leeway. Especially not during this time period, the show was as squeaky clean as the Wiggles, which brings us right back around to the point I made in Intermission 2. But I'm going to try to not harp on that too much because there is one shining positive. Victini. I have no idea how I've not grown tired of the cutesy Mew clone trope yet, but goddamn, Victini was cute. Giving him a bit of a sad backstory actually gave this movie some kind of life. Him missing his best friend and getting excited when he saw the ghost of him actually made me feel something. Which is more than I can say for most of this movie, so let's move on to Kirim and the Swords of Justice. Number 15 opens with Keldeo sparring with the Swords of Justice as part of his training to join their ranks. Through his battles with all three members, it's obvious he's in no way ready for said rank, as he has no command over his sword, unlike the others. This fact is reiterated when the Swords discuss if Keldeo is ready to take on the test of battling Kirim or not. Cobalion in particular makes it clear Keldeo is not yet ready, due to his inability to use his sword. However, Keldeo doesn't listen and ventures off to fight the dragon. During the fight, he gets his horn chopped off and his friends try to intervene but an enraged Kiram somehow transforms into his white form and freezes the trio. Keldeo now seeing that he stands no chance against a boundary Pokemon, flees the scene. This then transitions into our intro sequence, featuring the rival Destiny's theme which absolutely sucks. Okay, it's no Battle Frontier theme, but it's definitely not great. The bridge sounds kinda out of place, as does a male vocalist's overly soulful, raspy voice. He genuinely sounds like he's trying to curl one out. I'd almost prefer him to sound like Eddie Vedder from Pearl Jam. Freeze and rest his head on a pillow made of concrete again. Anyway, our heroes run into Keldeo who lands on a train they're travelling in. Obviously weak, he manages to muster a warning of Kiram's arrival, and like clockwork, the Ice Dragon shows up. Thankfully, the group is saved when the train goes through a tunnel, forcing Kiram to jump out of the way. Once the gang arrive at the destination, they get Kaldeo patched up and make friends with him. As they get to know him and learn about what happened to him, Kiram and his gang of Cryogonal descend upon the city, wanting to finish what the fall started. The gang managed to fight off the army of Cryogonal, buying them enough time to escape the city. Eventually arriving back where it all started, despite some apprehension and self-doubt, Keldeo manages to unlock his resolute form and his sword. Unfortunately, this isn't enough to win him the battle, but in showing determination, as well as a concern for his friends, he earns the respect of Kurem. Following the battle, the Swords of Justice officially welcome their young recruit as a member, and with that, the credits roll. As you probably gathered from how short that plot summary was, this is a very short film. In fact, it's the shortest Pokemon movie to date, clocking in at just about an hour in length, which I've got to say is an absolute blessing 15 movies in. Now earlier, I alluded to having seen one of these movies before and absolutely hating it. That was this very movie. I remember buying a DVD copy of it years ago and being really excited to watch it only to end up feeling ripped off and the length probably had something to do with that. But that wasn't all that bothered me about the movie. Now rewatching it, it has a pretty weak story 
as pain by numbers as an animated movie of any kind can get. It's also not that interesting. Any enjoyment derived from it is from being a Pokemon fan and even that only goes so far. But with that being said, the short length actually saved it in the end because if it was, let's say, half an hour longer like most Pokemon movies are, it would have been a much more painful watch. Thankfully this movie gets in, gets out and gets the job done. It may not be a very good job but shit, it's easier to sit through than most of these other movies which do the exact same thing but longer. Anyway, time for the final movie of the Best Wishes era, Extreme Speed Genesect. The movie opens with Mewtwo flying through the air, testing the limits of her powers with Mega Evolution. All of a sudden she hears a pleas of someone saying they want to go home. She follows the sound and finds a group of Genesect who are about to be caught in an avalanche. Using her strong abilities she manages to save the group and tries to get to know them, learning that they're in search of their home, not realising the world is a lot different from what they knew prior to being resurrected. Feeling a kinship with them being a fellow experimental clone Pokemon of sorts, she feels a desire to help the Genesect. However, the leader, a shiny Genesect, sees Mewtwo as an enemy and attacks her before fleeing with his comrades in tow. We then encounter our heroes who are exploring a nature park while we hear one of the worst theme songs so far. The past two were dull and somewhat forgettable, but this one is just straight ass. Even for a theme song from this godforsaken anime, the lyrics and singing are corny as all hell. The production is kinda messy too and it's just all around offensive to the ears. Anyway, while exploring the park, Ash and the gang happen upon the youngest Genesect of the bunch, who's still upset saying it wants to go home. Ash says it wants to help the Paleozoic Pokemon but unfortunately, some of his friends appear and attack everyone. Mewtwo then appears saving everyone, however, it becomes apparent that she has a distaste for humans. Later that night we see the Genesect attacking the Pokemon in the park before building a giant nest in the centre. Parts of the nest are obstructing some nearby generators which causes electrical problems in the city which alerts Ash and friends who are immediately attacked upon arrival being forced to take an alternate route. Meanwhile Mewtwo overlooking the city reminisces about her origin and how she once felt isolated before being shown some kindness by other Pokemon feeling the Genesect deserve the same love. A pair of Starly then appear and inform the mutant about the Genesect causing a ruckus in the park. Ash and Co encounter the young Genesect once again, who apologises for hurting them earlier, which leads Ash to conclude that the Red Genesect somehow controls all the others. Just then, the lights in the building start to flicker. One of the park staff, Eric, realises there's an issue with the power station and decides to go have a look. Then out of nowhere we see a brawl between a Feraligator and the shiny Genesect, with the latter getting the upper hand. Thankfully Mewtwo steps in, leading to a brawl which spills out into the city, while the remaining Genesect begin fighting with the Pokemon that live in the park. As both struggles progress, Mewtwo and the Red Genesect both find themselves back in the park, going all out against one another. The other Genesect join in too, and during the fight they land on some wiring which causes a massive fire. Ash, his friends and all other Pokemon in the park pitch in and extinguish as many of the flames as they can to save the Genesect, making them realise they're not their enemies like the leader would have them believe. And thankfully the leader also comes around to this idea after some convincing from Mewtwo who takes him up to space to talk. I mean, sure, why not? They both try to make their way back to Earth after settling things but almost die in the process, but they're saved thanks to everyone's efforts. They then decide that the Genesect should live in the nature park, Mewtwo makes a peace with humans and everyone goes home happy. The end. Extreme Speed Genesect, yes I'm calling it that and not the other shit ass name, is the final movie that I have any level of familiarity with. I watched it once when it had just come out and I remember really liking it. Now watching it with fresh eyes, I'm not sure what I was smoking. Getting the pros out of the way, the visuals are great and it was another short one so it was a lot easier to stomach. But that's just about all I can say in terms of positives because this movie is just... meh. It obviously tries a lot more than the last movie, but the issue is the runtime doesn't necessarily give it the wiggle room it needs. It doesn't give us a chance to look deeper into the minds of the Genesect and Mewtwo like it obviously wants us to. And it doesn't have the time to give us that same regurgitated message from Mewtwo Strikes Back like it so obviously wants to. Don't get me wrong, at this point I am very appreciative of a short runtime, but keeping it simple like the Swords of Justice did 
is a much better approach when given a shorter runtime. But regardless, let's take a short break and reflect, shall we? Before I give my general thoughts on the black and white slash best wishes here of the anime, I'd like to get some things out of the way first, because I'm sure for a lot of you who are still watching, there are probably some lingering questions. The main one being why I haven't been going super in depth with my analysis of these movies and combing over every little detail and maybe even going over some of the bigger details like the utilisation of certain characters. And the answer to that is simple. I realise a lot of people who end up finding this video who aren't my regular viewers will probably just skip to their favourite movie to see my take on it and then just leave. And for that very reason, I'm trying my best to be concise with my opinions on certain aspects of these movies, so I can just talk about it and move on. It makes things easier for me, and I feel like it makes the viewing experience a lot smoother. That goes double for the plot summaries. There's a lot more going on in these movies than what I'm covering, but I'm trying my best to just skip over all the filler and the fluff. Because believe me, there's a lot of it. In these films, characters just tend to go around doing random shit that's unimportant to the plot. And while it makes things feel a little more, you know, accurate to the source material, like the games and the TV show, which also involve a lot of going around and doing nothing, it doesn't really do anything for me personally, and doesn't really help to move the plot forward, which is why I just kind of skip over it. But for those of you who want a little bit more of an in-depth look, please do stick around till the end, because in the conclusion section, I will be going over certain things like character representation a little deeper than I have already. But anyway, the Best Wishes series, it wasn't the best watch on TV, and the cinematic entries, are much better. As mentioned earlier, there are bright spots in these movies, much like most of the movies, but by and large, they suffer from a lack of oomph, much like the TV show at the time. There's no real way to put into words. Maybe it's a change in the main cast of characters that made the show feel worse. Maybe it was something else. Either way, I highly doubt I'll ever revisit any of these movies or the Gen 5 anime period after I'm done with this video. Regardless, now we're going into Uncharted territory. I've not watched a single episode of the Gen 6 anime or beyond, so I'm going in with fresh eyes. And yes, before you ask, I am going to put my hatred of X and Y to the side while reviewing these next few movies. Diancy in the Cocoon of Destruction opens with the titular Princess Diancy running around some mines with her servants. She's then met by an elder carbink named Dace, who told her about the Heart Diamond, an artifact that keeps the diamond domain flowing with energy. He mentions how the diamond is dying and that Diancy must learn how to make a replacement from Xerneas. We're then treated to a flashback of Xerneas saving a bunch of wild Pokemon, including Dace, from some kind of dark aura. This then transitions into our intro, featuring a remade version of the original theme. It's a full version of the one that was used for the XY anime. When it was initially released, I found the TV version to be fine, but now hearing it again, I've realised how synthetic it sounds. I can't exactly place what makes it sound like that. Maybe it's some odd mixing and mastering techniques? I'm not entirely sure. And this full version isn't much better. It's way too catered to the flow of the credit sequence, featuring this odd glittery sounding passage when this Absol Mega revolves. Speaking of which, the opening credit shows Diancy exploring a city when she's attacked by a pair of thieves. Lucky for her, Ash, Serena, Bonnie and Clement are around and manage to save her. After introducing themselves to her, they decide to go grab a bite to eat when Team Rocket show up and kidnap Diancy. They take her into a clock tower and force her to make them diamonds. She happily obliges. However, the diamonds don't last very long and fade away shortly after Diancy is freed from the tower by a girl called Millis. This is due to the fact Diancy doesn't have the proper know-how to make real diamonds that will last, similar to the Heart Diamond. This weighs heavily on Diancy as we see her struggling to make diamonds later that night, but Ash and friends vow to help her find Xerneas and learn how. The following day, the gang decide to go shopping. While at the mall, Diancy's carbink bodyguards show up, which freaks her out and causes her to run away. Not realising who those Pokemon are, Ash and friends aid her in her escape. A little later, they decide to ask who the carbink were, but before they can get an answer, the thieves from earlier appear. After a bit of a struggle, Diancy gets a chance to escape thanks to her bodyguards, as well as Miller stepping in to save her. The carbink take everyone to the Diamond Domain, where Diancy is informed that the Heart Diamond 
is in its dying days. This moves her to tears as she feels helpless seeing her home and the very core of her community in a sense come crumbling down, but she's assured by everyone that she'll succeed in finding Xerneas. They all press on until Dancy eventually feels Xerneas' fairy aura emitting from a forest. Dace warns everyone to tread carefully, as the place they're about to enter is all a forest, the site of the catastrophe that almost killed him and many other wild Pokemon. He also reveals that the dark aura that was present that day was that of Yveltal, who now rests in said forest in a cocoon-like state. Despite this, they carry on, and Diancie finds a saviour Xerneas, who awakens her powers before leaving. Diancie doesn't get the opportunity to try out her newfound abilities, however, as Millis, along with her father Angus, pop up and reveal they had planned to steal the dual Pokemon once it learned how to make diamonds. Marilyn and Riot then appear and steal the mythical Pokemon, leading to a scramble for it, which ends up awakening Eveltol, who goes on a rampage, sucking the life out of the forest. Everyone tries desperately to either flee or fight back, to no avail, including Diancie who mega evolves, managing to hold off the destruction Pokemon for a while before the cavalry appears. Xerneas comes to the rescue, calming down its enraged counterpart before reviving the forest and everyone in it. Our heroes then return to the Diamond Domain, where Diancie uses her newfound powers to create a giant glowing butt pl I mean, a uh, heart diamond, and with that, the credits roll. Well. That sure was a movie. It wasn't bad, but there's nothing all that special about this one. There's nothing I can say about it that I haven't already said about the others. It's just a boring, largely inoffensive movie. I guess it gets points for featuring a twist in Millis' Double Cross. And I guess Diancie was a cool character too. Her ditzy naivety was quite endearing. But yeah, that's pretty much it. Giant glowing butt plug. Our next movie is Hooper and the Clash of Ages. It doesn't feature a theme song, which is probably a good thing, because the song for that season, Be A Hero, isn't great. It's another synthetic sounding, pop rocky track. We're definitely not missing out on much. Anyway, we begin with a scene of Hooper in its unbound form, arriving in some random desert village, where it begins summoning legendaries to fight for its own amusement. This causes a lot of problems for the villagers, so a man wearing a pendant arrives and traps a genie in the bottle, sealing it away for decades. Cutting to present day, we see a different gentleman wearing the same pendant, who hunts down the bottle and becomes possessed as soon as he touches it. We then see Ash and friends having fun by a pool, enjoying some snacks when all of a sudden a mysterious force begins stealing and switching around their food. Pikachu notices a hand coming out of some kind of portal to steal a donut and decides to jump in after it with Ash in tow. They discover it was Hooper who was causing all of the mischief and after some more cartoony antics ensue, Hooper is scolded by its handler, Mire. After getting the rest of the crew for one of Hooper's rings, they decide to set off at Dahara Tower, a local landmark they wanted to visit. But just as they're about to leave, the man with the bottle appears and unleashes a spirit from within onto Hooper, turning it into its rampaging, unbound form. Following a bit of a scramble, they manage to confine the Jin Pokemon, turning it back into its confined form. Once things have calmed down, Mira and Baraz reminisce about their childhood and how they view Hooper as family, also explaining that years ago the mythical Pokemon was actually quite helpful to the locals before getting carried away and having to be tamed as we saw at the start. The group's conversation is then interrupted by Team Rocket, who swipe the bottle, freeing the evil side of Hooper and destroying the bottle in the process. Mira and Baraz implore Hooper to fight the spirit off, as they use their powers to aid it in its struggle. Hooper eventually succeeds and manages to separate itself from the spirit, which manifests into a ghostly copy. After some failed attempts to subdue the Titan, Hooper decides to summon Lugia, who willingly lends a hand. As our heroes make their escape, they realise they'll need to head to Dahara Tower, to make a new bottle out of the remains of the old one. Using one of his rings, Hooper transports a group to the tower, with him and Ash staying behind, as he can't travel for his own rings in his current state. The pair try their best to hide from the shadow, as they call it, but it's no use, as they're forced to fight as both Hooper and the shadow summon a bunch of legendaries, starting an all-out war. This conflict eventually brings everyone to the tower, as the shadow tries desperately to take it down, realising what's going on inside. Fortunately, Ash manages to hold it off long enough for the bottle to be reforged, as Baraz seals the demon away. However, the bottle flies out of his hands, forcing Ash to grab it, 
becoming possessed in the process. Hooper manages to cleanse the spirit by showing it all the great memories it shares with its friends. But the day isn't saved just yet, as the balance of space and time was disrupted due to the constant summoning and battling of legendary Pokemon, causing a massive rift to swallow up the area around the tower. The mischief Pokemon now having proper command over its unbound form, uses its rings to help evacuate a bunch of civilians in the area. Unfortunately, it still can't save itself, as it's struggling to get through its own rings, but thanks to some divine intervention courtesy of Arceus, it manages to make it through. With the rift now eliminated and the city safe, the day is saved. Hooper and the Clash of Ages is probably the best of the four shorter films we've had so far. It took a while for me to like it, but eventually it did grow on me. I initially found Hooper to be quite annoying, but as things progressed, I grew to appreciate his unique character. I also liked the subtle theme of inner struggle presented through Hooper. It was quite a nice touch. As was the little subplot or character detail, so to speak, of Miri and Baraz being the chosen people, people who follow Arceus like a god. I thought it was pretty cool, it actually kind of draws some comparisons to some real world religions from what I can tell, it's a, it's a sweet detail. Anyway, best movie we've had in a while. Let's see if Volcanion and the Mechanical Marble can top it. The movie opens with a man called Levi and a woman called Cherie piloting an aircraft carrying some kind of capsule when they notice they're being pursued by none other than Volcanion. Levi faces off with a beast using some abused looking Pokemon he forces to Mega Evolve. During the battle he attaches some kind of tag to the legendary before sending it flying off the ship. We then cut to our heroes who are getting in some battle practice to stand tall, which is the most butt rock, car commercial, imagined dragon sounding ass theme I've ever heard. I'm a massive fan of rock music, but this sound in particular drives me up a fucking wall in a way I can't explain without making this video about something completely unrelated going on an hour long tangent, but I'm not Quinton Reviews, so I'll just leave you with this. It's a horrible song. Absolutely awful in every way. Oh yeah, and this full version doesn't do it any favours. It has a good build up, but what it builds up to is akin to sticking your dick in a blender, so I'll pass on listening to this one ever again. Anyway, after the battle, Volcanion comes crashing down near everyone, and during the crash, a tag similar to the one on Volcanion attaches itself to Ash, bonding the pair via an electromagnetic pulse. Volcanion doesn't seem all too phased by this however, as he's dead set on getting his own back at Levi, taking Ash with him. The pair eventually arrive at the site where we discover the capsule contained a Pokemon known as Magena, who is sought after by Prince Raleigh of the Azov Kingdom and his assistant Alva. The Prince explains that Magena is an artificial Pokemon created by a scientist called Nicola and then babbles on about how him having the Pokemon is important to the kingdom and stuff. Unfortunately for him, during a bit of a skirmish, Ash and Volcanion end up with Magena and end up escaping with it. After escaping, the group take a break and end up reuniting with Clement, Serena and Bonnie. It's here we learn Volcanion is very distrusting of humans, but Magena takes a liking to Ash and his merry band of idiots and demands Volcanion let them join. Begrudgingly, he agrees and the group continue their journey when they encounter Team Rocket, who are hired by Alva to track down Ash. The trio even have their own abused Megas, which obviously rubs our heroes the wrong way. But they end up being a big help to Team Rocket, as Ash and friends struggle to escape, but Riley's sister Kimia makes a save. After getting the group out of harm's way, she gives some context on why the prince is after the artificial Pokemon, that being his interest in arcane technology. However, she believes Alva has led the young boy astray and probably wants Magena for selfish reasons, which is why she wants to stop her brother. The gang eventually arrive at the Naval Plateau, which is a sanctuary of sorts that Volcanion watches over. It's for Pokemon that were hurt in some way or another by humans. And while there, Clement figures out a way to free Ash and Volcanion of their bands, thanks to a gulpin. Everyone's laughing and having a great time, but the party is inevitably crashed as Levi and Sherry invade, holding a bunch of Pokemon hostage, forcing Magena to surrender herself. She's taken aboard a ship where an excited Raleigh quickly becomes distraught, as Alva tears Magena's soul heart out of her chest, discarding a poor lifeless body for our heroes to try and salvage. He then directs the ship to the kingdom where he seeks to use Magena's core to control part of the wall surrounding Azuf, 
which has the ability to turn itself into a flying fortress. Once Alva gets the fortress mobile, he attempts to fire a cannon at Ashenko, but fails because Magena's core refuses to cooperate. This gives our heroes a chance to fight off the villains and board the vessel, eventually restoring Magena and saving the naval plateau. This movie was a little longer than the past few, returning to that standard length of about an hour and a half, give or take. I wasn't too excited about that because the short runtime actually works better for my tastes, but on the plus side, this movie utilises its time well. A lot of it did initially feel like fluff as I like to call it, but as the movie progressed, it became obvious it wanted to flesh things out a bit, building up some tension, establishing the general setting and relationships, as well as character arcs. And it worked in some respects, but in others, it really didn't. The characters being the most obvious example. I'm sure you're all aware of the phrase, too many cooks spoil the broth. Well, we've got a classic case of that here with how many random characters they threw in. Levi, Sherry, Alva, the prince and princess, and two legendaries with their own backstories. It made for a very messy product, which could be hard to follow for some, especially when you consider how many flashbacks and exposition dumps it crammed into this movie. Jesus! This is probably the messiest movie since Gen 3. The only reason I'm not absolutely rinsing it is because it manages to keep it together well enough to tell a decent story and have some bright spots. One of which being Volcanion. He's not the most original character ever, but there's enough different about him to make him feel fresh when compared to past characters with similar personalities. The main thing being his relationship with the very tender Magena, who's a pretty decent character in her own right. It's a classic odd couple dynamic, with Magena being a bit of a princess in her own right, who the rough and ready Volcanion bows to, even when he doesn't necessarily want to. The mechanical marvel also does a good job at keeping a decent pace. Despite the runtime, at no point in the movie did I find myself just sitting through it, waiting for it to end. While it didn't exactly breeze by, it did have enough cool shit to keep me interested. But it does lose some points for how many characters there were, some of which you could argue were completely unnecessary. And having two whole fake out deaths at this point was probably the worst and most tired thing they could have done, but oh well. Although, it is somewhat made up for by giving Team Rocket some of their best roles yet. Especially Meowth with him bawling over Magena being abused. So with all of that out of the way, how do I feel about the X and Y era of movies? I thought they were okay, they were all fairly middle of the road, with a little bright spot here and there in each of them which kept me engaged at the very least. But beyond that, the formula is kinda starting to feel tired, especially since these movies didn't do all too much to expand or innovate on the formula. Of course, you could say that for just about every one of the 19 movies we've covered so far, but at least in most of them, there was a little incremental change or shift that you could see and appreciate. In the case of these movies, however, I can't think of anything off the top of my head that they did different or better than the Diamond and Pearl or Best Wishes movies. That being said, that doesn't mean they're lesser. I'm sure you can make a case for these movies being better than some of those ones, even if I wouldn't agree. There's not much else I can say about these three, so let's move on to the Gen 7 movies. So our next movie is a weird one in that it's not an original story at all, and is instead a retelling of the first episode of the show, and some of the events that follow the first episode of the show, from what I can gather from trying to do spoiler-free research. It basically starts off its own self-contained alternate timeline, which will be expanded upon in the next couple of movies, I believe, which is interesting. I'm not going to recap the first episode or anything for comparison's sake or whatever, because I'm pretty sure everyone and their mum has seen it at this point. But I will say that the first 20 minutes or so are pretty much the same as the first couple episodes of the show. Minus the inclusion of Misty. We even get to see Ash capture Caterpie in the opening credits, which naturally features a modernised re-recording of the original theme. It's fine, it's almost one to one actually, but it's cut off when the solo is supposed to start, which is kind of a poor decision, but they make it work. I'd still say I prefer both the TV and Mewtwo Strikes Back versions. The TV one in particular has an antiquated quality to it that this one's missing that makes it what it is. Anyway, like I said, this movie is pretty much in line with canon events, 
until a kid shows up to the Pokemon Center carrying a Vaporeon in his arms, claiming it was beaten up by Entei. This causes everyone in the building, including Ash, to make a beeline for the forest, in hopes of catching such a strong and rare Pokemon. Ash manages to find the beast, but so does a girl called Verity and a young wannabe professor called Sorrel. The three of them scramble to catch Entei, but as to be expected, they all fail and Sorrel decides to take his leave before telling Ash and Verity that it's gonna rain. The pair ignore his warning and decide to battle, blaming each other for letting the legendary Pokemon get away. In the process, they wake up an Onyx and some chaos ensues, but they manage to calm it down before the storm starts. The pair then head for shelter, but happen upon an abandoned Charmander, just like in the show, wow! The Charmander's trainer Cross pops up and doesn't want anything to do with the poor guy, so Ash decides to take it and find some shelter. He finds a cave where Sorrel happens to be, and the aspiring professor then nurses a dying Pokemon back to health, as everyone settles down for the night. Entei then appears out of nowhere with a parade of wild Pokemon, as they all snuggle up together opposite Ash and friends. This prompts Sorrel to tell his new friends about the story of Ho-Oh and the legendary beasts. Ash then reveals he has a rainbow wing from when he saw Ho-Oh fly overhead. Sorrel tells him this is a sign that he was chosen by the bird as a rainbow hero, someone who must challenge it to a battle. So the group set off to do just that, hoping to grow strong enough on the way. This leads to Ash participating in a bunch of battles, including one with Cross. Ash decides to use his newly evolved Charmeleon, but Cross's Incineroar wipes the floor with it, allowing Cross to talk down to Ash about his abilities as a trainer. This evidently gets to Ash, as he begins to say things like, Pikachu could have won that battle, and I wish I got Bulbasaur or Squirtle as my first Pokemon instead. Shortly after arguing with his friends, Ash ends up in the woods, where he's put into a deep sleep by a Marsh Shadow that's been following him around. While asleep, he dreams of a bleak world where Pokemon don't exist. The dream understandably shakes him up, but he makes up with his friends and presses on. After a brief pit stop to recreate the Bye Bye Butterfree moment, our heroes arrive at Mount Tensei, where they meet a man named Bonji. He guides the group to a crystal-like structure, where Ash must place the feather to summon the rainbow Pokemon, but before he can, he's confronted by Cross who believes he deserves to be the chosen one. A battle ensues, and Ash manages to eke out a win with his Charizard, but Cross won't have any of it as he grabs a rainbow wing off Ash. This corrupts the feather as he's not pure of heart like Ash. Marshadow then appears and uses a rainbow wing's powers to control a bunch of wild Pokemon to attack everyone. After much struggle and a fake out protagonist death, our heroes manage to overcome this ordeal and Ash gets his battle with the legendary bird. Following this, Ash, Verity and Sorrel say their goodbyes, setting off on their own separate adventures, and with that, the credits roll. I'll be completely honest, my expectations for this movie were in the fucking gutter. Like, come on, a reboot slash retelling in the form of a movie? If I've learned anything from Ratchet & Clank, it's that that shit doesn't work. But in this case, I stand corrected, and happily so. The iconic moments that are redone or retold are done so with a lot of respect for how much weight they hold for OG fans. And despite feeling like somewhat of a pandery bit of media, it still feels new and exciting like any good reimagining should. Also, the care that was put into establishing new characters and scenarios and making them fit into this old story made new should be applauded. Both Verity and Sorrel are solid new companions with good backstories, with Verity being implied to be Cynthia's daughter, and Sorrel having to see his looks ray freeze to death as a child. I never said they were created equal. The weight of familial expectations and childhood trauma are extremely adult topics by Pokemon standards. But this is exactly the shit I've wanted from the anime since day one. Same with Cross as a rival slash villain, this guy is a certified hater. He is pure evil for almost every second he's on screen, and I love it. Having an actual threatening villain is awesome. Having someone who actually feels like a bad guy is great, and having someone who gets into Ash's head so much that he practically changes his entire personality for a couple scenes is fucking beautiful. I mean honestly, I was shocked. This is some shit you'd never hear from the anime version of Ash. He's all smiles all the time, but this guy has depth. 
he doubts himself, he blames those around him, and he's flawed, which in turn makes him perfect. And that's just the characters, I haven't even got into the pacing yet. The pacing of this movie was perfect, every scene bled into the next seamlessly, and it made the viewing experience exponentially smoother than usual. It almost made it hard for me to keep track of what was actually important while scripting and what I could gloss over and ignore. Look, there's very little I can complain about with this movie, that wouldn't just be a glorified nitpick, so I'll leave you with this. If you're a fan of those early Canto episodes, give this movie a watch for sure. Movie 21 The Power of Us carries on our new timeline, opening with a scene of a girl called Reza visiting a brother in hospital who asks her to catch a Pokemon for him at the upcoming Wind Festival in Fuller City, a request she begrudgingly accepts. We then immediately cut to our intro sequence. No theme song this time, which makes sense, but it does introduce us to a vibrant cast of characters for this film, which are as follows. Margot, the daughter of the mayor of Fuller, Harriet, an old lady who hates Pokemon, Torrin, a scientist who's a nervous wreck, and Callahan, an older gentleman who can't stop telling tall tales. We see all our new characters go about their business as the festival commences, eventually encountering each other by chance. Ash shaves Margot from some bullies, Reese asks Callahan where she can find this mystery Pokemon she's after, and Harriet hands some important documents to Torrin, with Callahan popping up right after she leaves, asking to borrow one of Torrin's Pokemon for the catch race, in exchange for doing a presentation for him. Speaking of which, Callahan manages to back up all of his bullshitting by winning the catch race, with Ash coming second. During his acceptance speech, Callahan mentions a rare Pokemon in the local area and how he wants to catch it. This piques the interest of some hunters who are watching the broadcast, as well as Margot. We later see her bring this up to her father, suggesting said rare Pokemon is a mythical Terra Aura, but her dad snaps at her, telling her to ignore the rumours. Meanwhile, we see Harriet being followed around by a parade of Pokemon, which turns out to be the result of her getting some sweet scent serum on herself when she visited Torrin's lab. Following this, we see Risa track down Ash, asking for his help to catch an Eevee, after being sent on a wild goose chase by Callahan. She succeeds and the pair get to know each other, as they find out Risa used to be a champion level runner, but got injured, forcing her to retire. After that, both of them make their way back to the pier, where they learn someone's been vandalising the local area, causing the festival to shut down temporarily. Ash, Risa, Margo and Callahan all decide to pitch in and help clean up, although Callahan is really worried he'll miss his presentation, and only really agrees due to pressure from his niece Kelly and his sister Mia. Despite trying his best to make it in time, he's too late, and Torrin is forced to do the presentation himself. In his nervous state, he plays the wrong footage on the projector, showing that he in fact helped Callahan cheat at the catch race. This upsets both Mia and Kelly, and actually leads to the latter getting so upset, she begins to feel ill. But there are bigger fish to fry, as Harriet, who was watching the presentation from Torrin's lab, finds Team Rocket snooping around. The trio steal an effect spore capsule from the lab before using a smoke bomb to escape. This causes mass panic, with everyone evacuating the research building. Ash tries to catch Team Rocket but ultimately fails, but so does Team Rocket, dropping their loot in a field while trying to escape. The following day, the entire town is in an uproar, as the windmills have stopped working, we learn this is due to something called the Eternal Flame being stolen. Turns out the thief was Margo, who's trying to put an end to the festival to stop people from looking for Zera Aura. Unfortunately for her, it doesn't make much difference, because the hunters from earlier turn up anyway, but thankfully, Margo and her friends are saved by her heroes. But more problems arise as the capsule Team Rocket left on the ground breaks and causes an explosion leading to power outages and fires all over the city. This forces the entire city to work together and make sure the city and forest aren't destroyed. And with a little elbow grease, the citizens manage to save their homes and get to have a proper end to the festival. And with that, the credits roll. I sure as shit hope that plot summary made sense because I tried my absolute hardest to not just copy and paste a Bulbapedia article for this one. This is one messy movie. At least when it comes to actually breaking it down and writing a script about it. I'm sure from a viewing sense it's easy enough to follow, but there is a lot going on here, for better or for worse. Right off the bat, I can say this is the most ambitious Pokemon movie to date, and for that, I hold it above at least half of these slugfests. 
But that ambition kind of bites it in the ass because this movie tells its narrative through constant jumps from character to character. And this back and forth makes things messy and hard to keep track of. It is a positive in the sense it helps build these characters up and makes them feel important. But there's not a lot of room for things to breathe in this movie, which I don't mind too much from a pacing perspective, but the story suffers because of it. Speaking of the characters, while we could have done with one or two fewer characters, the fact that basically all of them have real, discernible personalities really makes up for it. Especially when those personalities are highlighted or used as plot devices. Seeing Torrent overcome his anxiety, or seeing Rita overcome her self-doubt and fear of injury, or seeing Callahan, you know, realise the error of his ways, really just adds to the movie and, you know, livens things up. But at the same time, there are so many moving parts, it's hard to get attached to one singular thing for too long. I feel like this is a movie that would benefit greatly from repeat viewings because it is a little all over the place the first time around. Okay, but story aside, there is a lot to enjoy here, especially from a visual perspective. The new art style is great, there's a very similar one in I Choose You. Both movies have very bouncy, rubbery animation and it really helps to bring everything to life. Especially during battles and dire moments, the more modern anime look these movies have is definitely something I can appreciate, especially after years of the same stale original look. Anyway, my personal opinion on this one is that you should give it a fair shot and check it out yourself because I don't think I can do this one justice. It was hard for me to decide what to mention and what to leave out of the plot summary because so much of this movie hinges on you watching it and understanding it first hand rather than having it regurgitated back to you. Which made it a bitch for me to write about but like I said, from a viewing perspective it's very easy to follow thanks to its tightly written story. Okay so this movie is pretty much a footnote in the grand scheme of things so I'll make this one quick. Movie 22 is a remake of Movie 1. It's a fine remake, but I'd never watch it over the original. It changes a few things here and there, but they're so minor it might as well just be a one-to-one -one remake, just in 3D. Oh yeah, it's uh, it's 3D. Uh, the one and only 3D Pokemon movie. The direction they went is decent, most of the Pokemon and characters look good. But it does have a very stilted almost, this will be Pokemon graphics in 2013 look to it. The characters go from looking alright, to looking way too realistic to the point of looking uncanny, very quickly. It's very inconsistent, anime doesn't translate all too well into 3D, especially not this pre-sun and moon era style of art direction they're trying to emulate in this film. It almost feels like watching that one episode of The Simpsons when Homer turns 3D. It doesn't feel right and the mostly inferior changes made to the script and progression make this the inferior version by a country mile. It's still Mewtwo Strikes Back at the end of the day so it's still a good watch but as someone who's watched that version of the movie at nauseam, I know for a fact I won't be revisiting this version probably ever. Especially since it has a worse rendition of the original theme today. It's a remake of the Billy Crawford version, which is a nice touch, leaning into that whole redoing the movie thing. But it's almost unrecognisable with the horrid electronic style they went with. Only keeping traces of the Crawford version like the delivery and a fragment of that awesome solo which is drowned out by the blaring synths. They try, but it's such a nothing version that hinges entirely on your love for the TV version. Anyway, don't watch this movie, you're better off with the original. Prologue or no prologue. Okay, so ignoring that nothing burger of a remake, the two Gen 7 movies are pretty good. I'd say Power of Us is a whole lot more inconsistent than I Choose You, but should be given a chance if you enjoy the latter. Because while the connection between the two isn't really all that apparent, unlike the Creation Trio saga, they're still cut from the same cloth, despite being two things that can be enjoyed independently of one another. Both share this cool rubbery art style, paired with visual gags often in the form of slapstick. Both have really tight storytelling that demands you pay attention because almost every second matters. And both have more of that anime-esque feel to them. I think that's probably because of the era they came out in. 
From what I understand, the Sun and Moon era changed the entire vibe and direction of the show. Creating a Pokemon anime with more modern and updated sensibilities, being more reflective of what newer anime fans are conditioned to expect from the medium. And this change extends to these movies and it's certainly for the best because these movies are much better for it. Anyway, how about we dive into the final movie of the bunch, Secrets of the Jungle. I can't believe I'm saying that, holy shit I am so fucking ready to be done with this video. The movie opens with a bunch of Zarud causing havoc in the forest of Okoya, bullying wild Pokemon and stealing their food. Once done, the tribe decides to return to their resting place. All except one, who hears the cries of an infant and decides to investigate. As it turns out, the infant is actually human and, despite being initially apprehensive, he decides to take it in, realising it'll die if he leaves it behind. Much to the chagrin of his peers, who remind him that he cannot allow outsiders into their home. Caught at a crossroads, the lone Zaru decides to abandon his tribe and search for the child's parents. We then get a little montage of said search to the theme song Always Safe, which I'm pretty sure was made exclusively for this movie. And you know what? It's not exactly my thing, but it works in the context it's used. Seeing the child having fun and eventually growing up under the care of Zarude is very heartwarming and having a cutesy pop song as a score to these moments certainly works, however uninspired said pop song may be. Anyway, following this we see Ash and Pikachu exploring the jungle, trying and failing to catch some new Pokemon, before meeting a researcher who tells them she and her team are searching for some healing springs. Speaking of which, we see the child now grown up and known as Coco, breaking away from his dad to end a fight between a Flygon and a Pangoro. He notices a Flygon is mad because it's injured, so he lures it out to the Zarud's healing spring, which, while solving that problem, brings about another one, as one of the Zarud from the tribe takes exception to Coco luring outsiders into their territory. This leads to a short scrap, with Coco's father putting a stop to it, and apologising to the Elder before taking his leave. Coco is chastised by his guardian for encroaching upon the tribe's turf, which causes the youngster to lash out and say the fact that he doesn't know a single move leads him to believe he isn't a Zarud at all. He then swings off on some vines and ends up knocking himself out by hitting a pipe head first. He plummets down to earth, landing in a river, but thankfully Ash fishes him out and takes him to the nearest Pokemon Center to get patched up. Once he comes to, he begins to freak out, but after some cartoonish hijinks and some bonding, he becomes friends with Ash and begins to realise he's a human too. He decides to take his new friend to meet his father, but once they meet up, an argument breaks out over Zarud hiding the truth from Coco for so long. Zarud apologises and then takes him to an abandoned lab, showing Coco a picture of his biological parents before leaving. Ash and Coco rummage around a bit and eventually find a hard drive with a logo on it that Ash recognises from the scientist he met earlier. The next day, they take it to the head of the research facility Dr. Z, and Ash introduces Coco to him. The doctor seems surprised and goes on to explain that Coco's parents died in a car accident years ago. To verify Coco's identity, he scans a pendant Zarud gave him which revealed his DNA to be a match, but there were also files among the data, most of which are corrupted except for one lone image of the tree the Zarud tribe call home. Zed urges the boy to direct him to the tree, but he refuses and flees the scene, going directly to the tree. Unbeknownst to him, Zed planted a tracker on him. Zed apologises for fooling the boy, before immediately restraining him as well as Ash. When he and his team arrive at the tree, they learn that the heart tree is indeed the source of the healing water. Zed decides to fire a missile at the tree to force some water out, having no regard for the tribe that resides there. Ash and Coco manage to escape and fight off Zed, who reveals he was actually behind the death of Coco's parents, who knew the heart tree was the nest of the Zarud and didn't want to disturb it. This then leads to a lengthy battle with Coco's dad almost dying in the process, but with everyone including the forest Pokemon joining forces, they manage to topple the evil doctor. Everyone then pitches in in rebuilding the jungle, fixing the damage Zed caused. Once everything settles down, Ash says his goodbyes and leaves to continue his travels, and Coco, deciding to follow in his footsteps, starts an adventure of his own, and with that, the credits roll. My biggest takeaway from this movie 
is holy fucking shit, Ash actually has a dad, he actually mentioned his father. Okay sure, we never get to see him and don't learn much about him and this isn't the same Ash from the show but Ash having a dad at all is wild. Oh yeah, also the, the movie itself was fucking great. The biggest strength this movie had was keeping things straightforward and easy to understand. But that doesn't mean this one is dull. If anything, this is one of the best so far, with complex storytelling which, again, is fairly easy to follow and understand and is enjoyable for people of all ages. You have some sympathetic main characters in Coco and his dad, one of which trying to figure out how to be a father despite never having one, and the other trying to figure out who he truly is while making an honest effort to be accepted by who he sees as his peers. Then you have one of the best villains in any of these movies in Zed, a legitimately deplorable villain who essentially murdered his colleagues in cold blood because things didn't go his way. It's pretty intense stuff, especially by Pokemon anime standards and yes I know I keep saying that and it's probably a little annoying to hear but as someone who grew up watching a lot of the show and has now seen all of the main series movies, I can say confidently I know the vibe the show tends to go for and this ain't it. But maybe that's a good thing because it makes moments and characters like this that much more impactful and impressive. I think this is another movie you should watch and experience yourself and properly appreciate because there is so much gained from experiencing the flow and pacing first hand. Especially with all the extra bits like the cute interactions between Ash and Coco, Team Rocket's B-plot where they end up getting Zed arrested for his crimes, and the Zeru tribe seeing the error of their ways after getting help from the forest Pokemon. This is as close to perfect as a Pokemon movie can get. Yes, even though it gave us yet another fake out death. The fact it was actually making me choke up a little at this point after so many fake outs speaks volumes about how well written the movie was and how much I cared about the characters. I don't even have to say it, just go check out the movie because you'd be doing yourself a disservice if you don't. And with that, we've tackled all 23 Pokemon movies. But we're not done yet because there's some more stuff I want to talk about. But before all of that, I'd like to thank you all for getting this far. I know long videos aren't everyone's cup of tea, so I appreciate the support. This project has been a long time coming. It's been in the works for like a year and a half, maybe longer at this point. It took so long that the anime ended, got a reboot, and then GTA 6 got announced. There were so many setbacks in terms of getting collaboration sorted, mental and physical health, finding the motivation, and so many other things, big and small, that I'm just so fucking happy to finally have this video out and get back to my usual style of video. Especially since there were a lot of trials and tribulations that came with trying to watch and review these movies as someone who doesn't understand the medium well. I don't watch many movies and for that very reason, I can't talk about them in the same informed or eloquent manner that I do video games. And that goes double for these films because they're anime movies and I don't watch much anime either. I've been getting back into it a little recently, but I'm by no means an expert. Now me saying that probably has a lot of you guys scratching your heads, asking why I even bother to make the video in the first place, and there are a few reasons. First and foremost, I thought it would be a fun labour of love project. I always wanted to make one of those egregiously long videos you see pop up on YouTube recommended every once in a while, but it's never really been my style. As you guys have likely noticed, a lot of my reviews, like the Mega Man Classic reviews for example, are quite short and that's for a reason. I don't want to stretch videos out with a bunch of pointless waffle like some YouTubers do. If I don't have much to say about a particular game or topic, I refuse to pad things out. It's one of the rules I set for myself when I started the channel. So a longer video felt almost impossible for me to make just talking about one singular game, so I thought, why not do something video game adjacent instead? And being a massive Pokemon fan, it just made sense to me to make a video talking about the Pokemon movies in my usual format, just longer. The second reason for making this video was honestly the prospect of getting more eyes on the channel. I've been posting videos on this channel on a very consistent basis for quite a few years 
years now, but I've always struggled to gain a larger audience. I've always been very appreciative of the cult following that I've built for myself, but I'm not even at a thousand subscribers yet because it's been such a struggle to get there and I'm kind of tired of having nothing to show for my hours of hard work. So the idea of making a video that's more algorithm friendly than my usual stuff and that can help me farm watch time was quite intriguing. Because even if it clips the rest of my channel, maybe I'll get some more diehards on board or maybe even reach some people I never would have otherwise. So yeah, it was mainly the idea that it would be a fun project and also views. So hopefully this video gets more than a couple hundred views because uh, it was quite hard to make. But anyway, putting all that to the side for a second, I did say I was going to try going into more detail about things I liked and disliked about these flicks, so let's go over the characterization first. Let's start with Ash and Pikachu. For Pikachu himself, there's not much to say. His characterization was pretty much established in episodes 1 and 2 and didn't evolve much beyond that point. However, his bond with Ash seems to only strengthen over the series. I don't have any great examples that show this, but it is noticeable if you go from movie to movie like I did. It's there, it's just very subtle. Ash himself is also a very consistent character. A strong-willed and hot-headed guy who always means well and is willing to help out. He's never been the most deep or complex character, but he's always been consistent, even after his weird mental reset at the start of the Best Wishes anime. However, there are a couple things that do change about Ash over the course of the anime. He becomes a lot less impulsive and headstrong over time, for one. Going back to the original series of movies and then moving on to the Advance and Diamond and Pearl eras, it becomes obvious this part of him becomes a little more muted. He is still impulsive and as dumb as a bag of rocks, but his annoying stubbornness and impulsive acts are lessened. It's also a very subtle change, but noticeable in moments that mirror each other from movie to movie, and by extension from episode to episode. Perhaps in one movie he might try to attack a Pokemon with his bare hands, but a couple of movies later he'll think twice about doing something so dangerous. As for his utilisation from movie to movie, He's a main character and it's blindingly obvious when watching these movies. He's often the focal point and understandably so because most of these movies do tie in with his journey to become a Pokemon master. However, I do appreciate when they give him more of an assisting or backseat role. Ash's main quality as a character is wanting to be friends with everyone and finding the good in pretty much anyone and putting him in that type of role only helps characters like Tori and Coco shine brighter. His best iteration has to be from the last three movies, who, despite being a different Ash technically, is still the same lovable goofball from before. But as mentioned earlier, his depiction in I Choose You is what sold me on him because in these movies, Ash was mostly just Ash as I described him a second ago. Yet Ash in I Choose You displays negative traits and emotions mostly absent from Ash in the rest of the movies. And yes, I know Ash within the actual show has had the odd moment of doubt and has kind of let his emotions get the better of him, but those moments are few and far between, at least from what I can recall. Moving on to Team Rocket, they're probably the most consistent characters in the show, even more so than Ash. They're evil, but not really, because they'll help out when they need to, or when they want to. You guys probably noticed that I gave up on pleading for Team Rocket to be used in any meaningful capacity at a certain point. Hell, at a certain point I just stopped mentioning them altogether. And that's for two reasons. One, because I knew it was futile and they were almost always going to be in the movies out of obligation rather than any real plot relevance. And two, because, well, it's Team Rocket. Yeah, so... While Team Rocket have been taken seriously and been given serious-ish backstories in the anime before, I think the main issue is the fact that they're that Team Rocket trio. They're comic relief, they're a joke, and it's unlikely they were ever going to be given a serious role. But hey, you can't blame me for hoping they did, I mean, they're these great fan-favourite characters. Throwing them a bone every once in a while would have been nice. And they did for sure, but more often than not, they were just doing some kind of slapstick comedy bit, taking up valuable screen time, which sucks, but makes sense. Anyway, on to Ash's companions. First, Brock, the Pewter City gym leader. If you know Brock mainly from the show, then there's nothing new or surprising here. He's still the same old guy. He's still the level-headed straight man of the crew who only really breaks character when he sees a girl he likes. He's hard not to like, but if you're looking for great Brock moments throughout these flicks, 
you're gonna be disappointed. He and Misty both share the best moment in a way because both essentially reach their peak by movie 3 by battling Molly and actually doing something worthwhile. I guess you could make the case that Misty's best moment is her getting all flustered over Ash getting a kiss but that's more of a thing that's there for the shippers and people who care a little too much about Ash's love life and the less said about those people the better. Also since we're on the topic of Misty, much like Brock, she's essentially the exact same person as she was in the show. A strong, independent girl with a quick tongue who knows how to defend herself. I'd say Dawn and Iris are both similar to Misty in that sense. They're also fiery, confident female characters. But at the same time, they have unique characteristics that set them apart. Such as Dawn's naivety and a tendency to be less confrontational, and Iris's more abrasive personality and the general in-your-faceness. They're both fairly likeable characters, but nothing all too special, and I can't really remember them doing anything worthwhile in their respective appearances. Silen is in a similar boat. He's a fairly plain, nothing character that I didn't care for all too much back in the day, and his appearances did do much to sell me on him. He kind of took that straight man role Brock had to a degree and paired it with an equally chill attitude, but he will never be Brock. I'd lump Clement, Serena, and Bonnie into the same tier as Silen. They're also fairly bland nothing characters. I didn't watch any of the XY anime, so I don't really have that attachment to them that others might. From what I understand, Serena has some sort of weight as an actual love interest to Ash, but once again, I don't care much about the ships. Now, let's talk about May and Max. I firmly believe these guys have the strongest roles out of any of Ash's companions. Max may be less so, but it's only by a small margin, since May's movie was a lot more memorable, for better or for worse. But regardless of what you think of Wishmaker and Ranger, you have to admit these character moments were probably some of the best when it came to the main cast. Sure, they could both border on being kind of annoying, but becoming close with some annoying mythicals is a hell of a lot more than what any of the other companions did in their appearances. May in particular has been a favourite of mine for a while. She's up there with Brock for me as one of my favourite companions. I always loved her character design and outfits. She was always this cool in-between of Misty and Dawn. She still had an attitude but wasn't a Misty clone and had those same chill and caring vibes as Dawn. And those parts of her were on full display in Ranger, where she fulfills that caring motherly role, which I initially kind of made fun of, as did many other people, but now that I think about it that role was perfect because that's what she was doing for Max this whole time. She always watched over and took care of Max, since it was her job as his big sister. And that translated over perfectly with her relationship with Manaphy, which, while a little more overtly parental, was still not miles off of how she acted with Max in the show and in the rest of the movies. Speaking of Max, I've always kind of flip-flopped on if I liked him or not. I've not seen much of the advanced anime, and what I have seen was so long ago, so... It's hard to remember why I disliked him at times, but in these movies, he's been a pretty solid inclusion. I've already said everything I need to say about the whole relationship with Jirachi, so I won't stretch it out, but having that nerdy little brother in the group definitely did liven things up a little, even when he wasn't the focal point. All in all, I'd say the characterization in these movies is good, because... It doesn't stray away from the anime too often. The anime usually establishes a character's personality upon their first couple of appearances, and I think messing with that too much could lead to poor results. But on the flip side, when characteristics of certain figures are highlighted like with May's motherly nature, or even skewed like with Ash's unwavering belief in his friends, it can give us some great results. However, I'd still maintain that playing it safe was probably the best move. Maybe the only time I'd argue that these movies playing it safe was a good thing. Now I was initially going to go over the characterization of the star Pokemon for each movie as it were, on top of talking about the human characters, but I realised it would just be me repeating myself because with a lot of these guys, I don't really care about them much as characters, with a couple of notable exceptions. I was also going to rank these movies in sort of a tier list fashion, but I realised that would also lead to the same thing a lot of me repeating myself. So I thought, why not give you guys my top 5? I'll probably still be repeating myself, but at least I won't add an extra hour to the video. Anyway, number 5 is I Choose You. Once again, that Ash representation was just 
too good. As was most of the movie, a lot of care went into making that old story new again. But with that being said, there was a little too much of a reliance on dusting off the old content and reworking it. Here we have this shiny new Ash who's made new friends and has a new rival slash villain to be and in between him doing all this cool new shit, we have to shoehorn in this bye bye butterfree scene like that episode isn't the most overrated piece of shit ever. I get that it's a retelling and not a completely new story but those pace breaking retreads really do bring it down for me and stop me loving it as much as I should. Numbers 4 and 5 could honestly switch places depending on the day you ask me, but today, this spot is taken up by Zoroark, Master of Illusions. Yes, this one is purely because of the whole mother-son dynamic I spoke about in my summary and review of it. While maybe not the strongest movie overall, it being driven by the plot of a parent and a child trying to reunite while facing roadblock after roadblock, definitely bumped it up a few places for me. It was honestly like a splash of cold water in my face after being out in the sun all day. So many of these plots were samey with little tweaks to make them feel different and while you could argue this one feels like that too, this tweak was a lot more monumental in comparison to those tweaks. At number 3 we have the classic, Mewtwo Strikes Back. Everyone knows and loves this movie, so I don't have to explain why it makes a top 5. What I do have to explain is why it's not number 1 or 2. I think the main thing is me being burnt out on the movie. I watched it way too much growing up and have become sick of it and watching it twice more for this video didn't help things. Still, I can get over that and still appreciate this film for what it is, but what it is is kinda shallow in comparison to almost all of these entries on the list. If it wasn't for some of the more iconic moments like Mewtwo's monologue and Ash dying, it'd kinda just be a standard affair because the rest of the movie is kinda just average. But I guess that's all it had to be to be great. An average kids movie with some standout moments that would go down in infamy and it managed to pull that off. Number 2 surprised me because I liked this one but wasn't expecting it to rank this high. Number 2 is our final movie, Secret of the Jungle. A generic title but the furthest thing from a generic Pokemon film. I just gushed about it so I'll spare you guys but for those wondering why it's so high, I'd say it's purely because of how much I enjoyed it. It was charming, it had stakes and much like most of the movies I hold in high regard, it dealt with more adult and serious themes like oh I don't know, straight up murder. It was a great time from beginning to end, even with the fake out death so it takes a firm second place. Number one may be a little surprising to some of you, but to me, it's the main reason I got this far with this video. I know I've shit talked these movies and the anime in general a lot in this video, and I imagine that's been kinda upsetting to some of you die hard Pokemon anime fans. And while some of you may see it as unwarranted roasting and general rudeness, it does come from a place of love. I grew up watching a lot of the anime. And while I definitely didn't like it as much as the games, it still holds a special place in my heart. And much like with the games, I will demand more from the anime if I think it's slacking or not living up to its real potential. Which it really wasn't for the first few movies, at least in my eyes, and I almost gave up on this project worrying every movie after Strikes Back would just be some middle of the road shit, but along came Destiny Deoxys and it made me realise there's more than what meets the eye. This movie handled the topic of childhood trauma extremely well by giving us one of the best characters in Tori. A topic which I wouldn't have expected the anime to touch with a 100 foot pole, yet they knocked it out of the park. You can make criticisms of Tori's character like how he can be rude and annoying at times or how he may be a somewhat unrealistic representation of a child who's traumatised, but I think those types of criticisms would be largely misguided and would be coming from a place of ignorance. Of course a child who's traumatised is going to be abrasive and lash out on occasion. How else would a child react to trauma other than perhaps becoming withdrawn? Actually that's exactly what Tori is most of the time withdrawn. He only ever lashes out when scared or poked or prodded by people like Ash who don't understand his state of mind. If anything, this is a very real representation of trauma and trauma response. It's just babyfied to fit in with the vibe of the show. But beyond Tori and his brilliant character arc, 
as I've said already, the movie is paced well and the whole thing is animated beautifully. It's just a fun time front to back, even if you don't think about it on a deeper level. Okay, so that's my top five. If you're after more of like a, a tier list thing, here's, here's a makeshift one I made at one point. It's subject to change as is the top five, so don't take either of them all too seriously. Also, I wasn't really sure where to put this, so I'll just like this here. Um, I realised while watching the video back and kind of like editing and doing all of that production stuff, um, I did kind of end up hating on Pokemon 2000 a little too much in this video. I kept referencing it as a bad or underwhelming movie or an example of what's wrong with the Pokemon formula. and. That wasn't me being malicious or rude or anything like that. I wasn't trying to dunk on people who genuinely enjoy the movie because, as you probably noticed, I did give it a good, a good solid review, and I still think that. I still think it's a good movie. I just think it's a little over overpraised for what it is, which is an obvious downgrade from Mewtwo Strikes Back and kind of the beginning of that formulaic Pokemon movie structure. Or and it's kind of, I guess, it's kind of reflective of the Pokemon anime structure as a whole as well. So, yeah, I don't think it's a bad movie, I still think it's one of the better movies, even if I don't personally enjoy it all that much. But yeah, I still think it's good, and I still think it's solid, so, yeah, <laughs> don't come for me, Pokemon 2000 fans. Now, before I let you guys go, I want to walk you through my experience watching and reviewing these movies as someone who's not an anime or movie fan, at least not a big one. As mentioned previously, my main two motives for making this project were two things pushing myself out of my comfort zone and making a cool project I could be proud of and getting views. The formal was a more important reason to me and thankfully, I think this project turned out really well. But it wasn't without its trials and tribulations. As I said, there were many times where I wanted to quit, either because the movies felt like slogs, there was some hiccup during production, or the project in general was just taking way too long to complete and was completely taking over my life. But I think the main roadblock was watching these movies and trying to pull something out of my ass to say about them. While you do have your more laid movies, a lot of them are very much like an extended episode of the anime and nothing more. Which is fine and a great thing if that's what you're into, but I'm not. At least not all the time. But I think that was my first mistake. Expecting more. Anime movies based off pre-existing shows and movies typically aren't all that great, which is a fact I completely forgot going into this video. They usually just amount to being an extended episode, a what if scenario, or a glorified filler episode that means nothing, so it is kind of my bad for expecting more. But still, it's not wrong to demand or want something more than that when it comes to anime movies, even something as safe as a Pokemon anime. And while maybe 5 to 7 of these movies did something great or at least good, the rest did nothing all too special, which was very disappointing for me. However, I will say that those two that did push beyond what was expected of them made this whole ordeal worth it. But I don't want to seem like a downer, there were some very interesting concepts explored in these movies, there were plenty of fun and cute moments, and I will say that even the worst of these movies are totally watchable if you're in the right mood for it. However, when it comes to my final verdict, as it pertains to recommending the Pokemon anime movies, my answer isn't a yes or a no. It's a little more complicated than that. But to keep it short and not keep you guys here too long, I'll say this. If you're interested in these movies after watching this video, take into account that all of them, yes, all of them, require you to have that pre-existing, undying love for the franchise that many of us have. If you don't, then these movies will do nothing for you other than serve us a way to kill an hour or two. And there's plenty of better ways to do that. Now making the assumption you are a Pokemon fan, which is very likely if you made it this far, whether you've seen the anime or not, I'd recommend checking out my top 5, starting off with Mewtwo Strikes Back, then watching the rest in any order you choose. I feel like all 5 of those movies offer something that most of the others lack, and for that I'd say they're a great entry point. That's assuming you don't just decide to watch the actual anime instead like a normal person. And with that, we're finally done, and I cannot believe it. Thank you so much for to everyone who got this far, and I 
I, I do hope you sit throughout uh, through this outro too, just to hear my facts and hear a couple extra things I want to talk about. Uh, you don't have to stay if you don't want, I guess, but I will be giving a couple extra bits of context and stuff like that about the video uh, for those who are curious. Um, but I have got some notes here uh, about what to mention. Uh, first and foremost, I do want to thank Michael uh, from my uh, from the channel Michael Jose and former from the channel uh, former uh, formerly former four I think, but now it's I think it's just former. Uh, both great content creators, great YouTubers. Uh, check them out. Michael does. Uh, th these shows called Soundtrack Dips and Soundtrack Dives where he talks about um, kind of like music, uh, video game music. Sometimes they'll do a whole sort of soundtrack which is a sound uh, soundtrack dive and Soundtrack Dip is usually just one, maybe one or two songs. Um, and it's absolutely great, he's insane with his editing. If you're, fun of, if you're a fan of more elaborate stuff, more heavily edit, edited stuff than this video, then he's, he's, definitely, he's definitely a guy. He's really funny, he's really entertaining, go check him out. Farmer is more of kind of like, uh, he's similar to my content, he's, but he takes more of a serious, uh, you know, downbeat, serious, kind of like analytical tone to things. He doesn't go over the top, he isn't super, you know, out there with uh, with the stuff he says. He isn't, you know, he, he, he's just a really chill YouTuber to watch, great for, you know, binge watching. Um, Really analytical, really insightful, uh, and he is cooking, cooking up some stuff. I believe he he is a little sporadic, sporadic with uploads, but well, both of them are really. But uh, they are, rest assured, both of them will be uploading soon, and they are they have got some stuff in the pipeline. So go check both of them out. I want to say once again thank you to everyone who made it this far. Thank you so much, and I do hope you uh, decide to check out my future content. I have got a lot of stuff planned. Uh, I'm not going to spoil anything, but I've got some. Uh, I'm going to be going back to my regular review format. Basically, for those of you who are new, it's basically like this video, exactly like this video, edit, edited and uh, kind of um, uh, presented in the exact same way. Obviously, minus minus this type of unscripted stuff. It's all scripted. It's all basically like the main bulk of this video. Um, so I'm going to be doing those types. Uh, I'm going to be doing more reviews. Uh, I will be back with those uh, after a while. Um, I'm going to be looking at some some uh, cult classics. So let's just say that I'm not going to be going into too much detail because I don't want to spoil them, and I want to make sure they're set in stone before I start hyping them up. But please rest assured, I will be making some new good content coming back even stronger after I take a little break for this uh, after this video because. I, I, I'm actually required to take a break. I want to carry on full steam ahead, but I will probably have to take a break for a couple weeks, maybe, because my laptop is in dire need of being repaired. So I'm either going to repair that, uh, get that repaired, or just get like a brand new, uh, a brand new laptop or a brand new PC or something like that if I have the room. And and then after that, it's full steam ahead. And hopefully a lot of you, uh, a lot of you stick around to see the future of the channel because it is very exciting, and I'm going to try and up the levels and try and you know, a bit build my channel up and be even more uh, insightful and analytical and stuff like that, and you know, just make make my make my vid uh, my future videos you know just that much better, even better than what I've already made, which I'm very proud of. Um, for those, uh, and again, for those of you who are, who are new, who want to know what else to check out on this channel, obviously you're a fan of Pokemon if you made it this far, so I'd say please check out my review of all of the main series Pokemon games, which I mentioned at the start of the video. I'll probably link them throughout the video uh, through those little card things. If not, I will probably leave them in the description or put them on the end card for you to cl click after, after I'm done rambling, but yeah, please check those out and uh, recently I finished the Mega Man series, a classic series of reviews, feel free to check all of those out. Uh, a Link to the Past is one I did semi-recently that I'm very, very proud of, so check out my Link to the Past review. And yeah, thank you, thank you for making it this far. Once again, I am so, so happy to have this video out. It was such a long time coming and I'm so happy to finally have it done and have it out there. It is kind of surreal even recording this and thinking of, you know, the 
year and a half, maybe even longer that I spent, you know, chipping away at this video while I was working on other projects and trying to just get my life sorted, you know, going through so much stuff, moving, trying to find jobs, trying to do this and that, you know, trying to live a stable life and, you know, try, try you know, trying to, you know, you know, trying to make it to the next day pretty much and um, it has been very crazy. I have had a lot of mental health and physical health struggles um, and, you know, through it all I've just been trying to grind because this is what I really want to do in my life. I really want to, you know, entertain people even if I don't earn money from it. It's just such a fun, great hobby to have and I really do enjoy this. So, yeah, that is my top priority a lot of, a lot of the time. It's probably to my own de detriment. Um, you know, just wanting to make videos, wanting to entertain you guys or give you guys something to watch while you guys work your, work your mundane jobs, which I, I will be soon, possibly, I, I, I will be going back into employment soon. Uh, I've got a new job lined up and uh, hopefully won't take away too much from the, vi uh, from the videos and the video making, but we'll see. Hopefully it won't. Fingers crossed. But yeah, there were a lot of trials and tribulations with making this video, like I said, a lot of hiccups. Uh, there were a couple more collaborators that were supposed to be in this video who I either personally axed or uh, kind of had to drop out for one reason or another. Um, and it, yeah, it was just, you know, it, I, I know how feelings to those, those guys if they're watching, which they pro likely are. It was just in, in the best interest of f actually finishing this project because I was kind of dragging my feet at certain points and uh, I feel like adding more collaborators and just Michael and Former to this would have not only muddied the waters but also probably taken away from what I was saying about these um, movies and you know kind of taken away from the viewing, the viewing experience which is obviously the top priority. So now I have feelings to those people, um, I, I will be having some more collaborators in the future so if you are a fan of like the collabby segments that I did there will be more of those uh, for the viewers of course so yeah rest assured there is there is going to be more of that there are going to be more collabs in the future if and when I can make them work now for the Pokemon fans who may be upset, upset at me or the Pokemon anime fans more specifically um, I want to say once again I was probably mean uh, mean to the Pokemon anime or very disparaging or very uh, you know not nice about, about the Pokemon anime and the quality and the, the way it is and stuff like that and I want to say I, for, through it all, I have quite gained an appreciation and a love for the Pokemon anime. A little bit of a deeper one than, than I once did, and uh, I do I do appreciate it more. But I still don't think I'm a mega fan, and me pretending like I was was pro would have probably just been disingenuous and probably a little pointless. So the, keep, please do try and keep in mind. I'm sure I will get hit hit either way, but please do try and keep in, keep in mind. These are all my opinions. Feel free to make your own version of this video if you want. I, I don't care. Um, uh, or just you know leave comments and you know disagreeing with my stuff, agreeing with my stuff, giving your takes on each and every one of the movies. You know, doing all of that stuff. You know, I, I really appreciate it. Um, you know, I, I really appreciate. Uh, I really appreciate engagement of any kind, positive or negative. You know, R really having the, that type of discourse is what I make make these videos for. So. Um, yeah, but I, I, I do want to highlight, uh, it's not to save my own ass, it's just, I, I do feel like I should highlight, I do appreciate and love the Pokemon anime, I wasn't trying to be disparaging, like I said uh, just a little while ago, I wanted more from the anime, and unfortunately it didn't always meet my expectations, but I still enjoyed what I watched, and while I wouldn't probably revisit most of these movies ever again, um, if, I, if I had to, I wouldn't complain, if I was if I was going to do this video again in the future, which is probably very unlikely, I wouldn't complain. So yeah, I, I, I don't know, I think it's a, it's a fun project and I have a deeper appreciation for the Pokemon anime now, so maybe I'll do more of those videos. Which is actually the next bit I wanted to talk about. I will probably be doing more of these gaming adjacent videos, reviewing shows or uh, movies and stuff like that, that are video game related, maybe even products that are video game related. But I, I am going to keep them at a minimum, uh, make them an occasional celebratory thing maybe or just doing them in between reviewing actual games because reviewing actual games is what is my, is what my main bread and butter and what, I'm, what is my expertise so 
it's uh, you know me, me reviewing me reviewing movies and TV shows. Sure, over time I'll I'll get a taste for them and understand what makes a good TV show or a bad TV show. But in general, it's not really my bag, so you know I'm going to keep it an occasional thing. But for those who want to see more of this type of video, um, maybe if you reach a certain milestone, like 10,000 subscribers or something like that, which is a long shot right now, I'm under 1,000 at the moment, uh, but if we reach somewhat like 10,000 subscribers, maybe I'll review all of the specials and shorts in one video, and then maybe do individual reviews of the Pokemon seasons or something like that. Maybe not seasons, but like uh, the whole series, so the whole original series, the whole Indigo League, then all of the Johto Journey stuff, then all of the advanced, uh, advanced generation stuff, then Diamond and Pearl, etc. Uh, so I will probably do, be doing all of that at some point um, uh, if the reception to this video is what I mean, what I want out of it and if I do get the positive reception I really want and feel like this channel needs to give me the motivation to kind of follow through with those types of ideas and projects so yeah if you want to see more of that liking this video, commenting on it, giving me positive feedback and uh, you know getting the view count up, sharing it to your friends and stuff like that is the perfect way to get me to do more of these. And with that I think I've said everything I need to say so uh, thank you so much once again for making it this far. I really appreciate all of you and hopefully we can get to... I don't know... a, a thousand views, yay! <laughs> I, I don't tend to get more than that so yeah hopefully Hopefully we'll get we'll get to like a thousand views, something like that. Maybe more. Well, we'll see. We'll see. Um, maybe a thousand subscribers as well. Who knows? I'm currently sitting at like 600 something right now. So yeah, hopefully we'll uh, we'll see some positive feedback and grow from this, and I can continue making great content for you guys, and I'll have a reason to carry on doing this. So yeah, thank you so much for watching. I've been XYZ Cruncher, stay cool, stay safe, stay crunchy. I haven't said that intro in a while, so yeah, stay cool, stay safe, stay crunchy, and I'm out. Peace.